Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second Cleaner Energy Future Initiative for ASEAN, or CEFIA, Government Private Forum. Please allow me to introduce myself once again. My name is Alfred Christopher Gurning, the APAIC Technical Officer from ASEAN Center for Energy, and I will be the master of ceremony for today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, CEFIA serves as a platform to facilitate collaboration between public and private sectors in the deployment of cleaner energy and low carbon technologies in the ASEAN region. And today, at the second CEFIA forum, the ASEAN plus three government officials, international organizations, universities, and private companies are gathering online to share progress on ongoing activities and discuss future activities aimed at energy transition and the realization of a low carbon society in the ASEAN region. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start our event today, I want to inform you that if there are any questions during the forum, please kindly utilize the question function in the control panel to directly ask your question to the presenter. The presenter will then directly answer your questions. Thank you very much. We will now start our forum today by hearing the opening remarks from Dr. Prasad Sinsuk Prasad, Director General, Department of Alternative Energy Development and Efficiency, Ministry of Energy, Thailand. Dr. Prasad, please, the time is yours. Muneki of Koriti, Parliamentary Vice Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all from Thailand. On behalf of Thailand, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the second private, uh, government private forum of Cleaner Energy Initiative for ASEAN or in short, CQA. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining today's event. Today is a big opportunity and great honor for us to hold the second CPA cooperation with the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, METI of Japan, and ASEAN Center for Energy to discuss on the future action policy and its areas of cooperation and clarification on flagship projects. I have been informed that the CPA was established under the ASEAN Plus Tree new and renewable energy and energy efficiency and conservation program on November 27, 2019 in Vanilla, serving a platform to facilitate cooperative activities between public and private sectors in deployment of cleaner energy and low carbon technologies among ASEAN plus three, China, Japan, and South Korea countries. The activities have been resulted in making significant contributions to enhance energy efficiency and facilitating energy transitions. Ladies and gentlemen, as all of you are aware that we have been through an unprecedented situation since 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has been causing severe impact worldwide in all sectors. Development in the energy sector, as well as the climate change issue, have becoming increasingly challenging, but also represent significant opportunities, especially for clean energy, for energy transition, and shifting to a low carbon society. For Thailand, we have been building momentum in sustainable recovery and clean society after the virus outbreak. I will make emphasis on economic recovery and well-being of Thai people, job creation, wealth for rural community people in parallel with promoting renewable energy for inclusive economic, green and sustainable development are our key priorities. One of the most important projects this year is to promote distributed community power plants filled by fast-growing energy crops under a joint investment between community enterprises and private sectors, so-called community power plants. 
the project is designed to increase community income by selling energy for to increase community ownership as well as community involvement to the power plant. At this pilot phase, we expect to achieve 40 to 50 community power plants with a total capacity of 150 megawatts, which will stimulate an investment over 1 billion US dollars and create over 24,000 jobs for people in rural areas all over the country. In terms of energy transition, we are preparing ourselves to have appropriate regulatory framework by launching the regulatory sandbox campaign with 24 projects to test run new technology, innovation, and new business platforms in power sector, such as prosumers, peer-to-peer electricity trading, ancillary services, and demand response. As you can see, Thailand has a firm commitment to become a low carbon society, contributing to reduce global climate change issues with many clean energy initiatives. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the peer program will be a platform where data, information, good practices are collected and shared. Such platforms as a bridge between ASEAN plus three government officials, international organizations, universities, and private companies for collaborative efforts to drive this activity with innovative, cleaner energy technologies as they have a catalyst to accelerate green finance and investment. I am sure that our cooperation and this meeting will help not only to drive forward energy transition, but also help achieving for economic recovery as well as the climate action for sustainable development in our region. And so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Prazer, for your kind words. We'll now hear the special remarks from Mr. Munekio Koichi, Parliamentary Vice Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry, Minister of, from Japan. Mr. Munekio Koichi, please, the time is yours.経済産業大臣政務官の宗木を高知でございます。第2回セフィア官民フォーラム会合の開催にご尽力をいただきましたスパッタナポン大臣閣下大政府アセアンセンターフォーエナジーの皆様にはここからから感謝を申し上げますま
経済成長気候変動対策のすべてを実現させるためには各国はその地理的特性や発展段階を踏まえて現実的で持続可能なエネルギーシステムへの移行の道筋を考えることが必要でありますまたその道筋を具体的な行動に反映させていく必要がありますそうした中相互に経験を共有し合い学び合うことは非常に重要ですセフィアを含む ASEAN プラス3エネルギー大臣会合プロセスの意義もそこにあると考えますエネルギーの低炭素化を目指すセフィアについては2019年9月の立ち上げ以降さまざまな活動が積極的に展開をされています昨年11月の第17回 ASEAN プラス3エネルギー大臣会合では ASEAN のエネルギー協力行動計画への貢献を視野に入れてセフィアの下で具体的なプロジェクトを発展させることの必要性が改めて強調されましたそうした状況の中ネットゼロエネルギービル工場設備の連携制御マイクログリッドの構築といったセフィアのフラッグシッププロジェクトが着実に進展していますこれらのプロジェクトが実現をすれば ASEAN におけるエネルギーの低炭素化が一層促進されセフィアの重要性がますます高まっていくものと期待をしていますまた低炭素エネルギー技術へのファイナンスの動員に道筋をつけることもセフィアの重要な役割です本日の会合でもセフィアにファイナンスに特化したセッションを予定をしておりますセフィアを通じて国際金融機関政府事業者地場銀行などが一体となってプロジェクトへのファイナンスの在り方を考えていくことが期待をされますさらにセフィアの活動に関するアジア開発銀行と経済産業省との間の協力に関する覚書の署名も行いますアジア各国の持続可能な発展に大きく貢献をしているアジア開発銀行との協力を強化することはセフィア活動をさらに充実させる貴重な一歩と考えています本日は終日さまざまな参加者の皆様によって多様な議論が交わされますフラッグシッププロジェクトの実施エネルギー協力行動計画への貢献ファイナンス強化という3つのキーテーマについて豊かな議論がなされ ASEAN におけるエネルギーの低炭素化持続可能な発展が一層促進されることを期待をしています最後になりますがこの厳しい状況の中参加者の皆様方が安全で健康な生活を送られることを心からお祈りを申し上げてご挨拶をさせていただきます Thank you very much, Mr. Mune Kiyo Koichi, Parliamentary Vice Minister of Economic Trade and Industry, Ministry of Economic Trade and Industry, or MEPI Japan, for your special remarks. For the next session, we would like to, I would like to invite Mr. Christopher Zamora, Senior Manager of a p i p e Department from ASEAN Center for Energy, to deliver the presentation on review and recommendations of the first SEFIA Forum. Mr. Christopher, please, the time is yours. Thank you very much, Alfred, for the kind introduction.、Uh, before I proceed, allow me to greet you a pleasant good morning、uh, to Dr. Prasert Sensuk Prasert, the Director General of DD of the Ministry of Energy of Thailand, and of course to the Vice Minister from METI Japan, Mr.、Uh, Monique Yo Kuichi, distinguished. Uh, delegates and officials from the ASEAN Plus Three China Japan Korea community, colleagues from the ASEAN Center for Energy, a pleasant good morning to all of you. I hope everyone is safe in spite of the pandemic still、uh, hovering around the world. And please stay safe and healthy. 
On behalf of the ASEAN Center for Energy, allow me to briefly present to you a review and recommendations of the first Cleaner Energy Future Initiative for ASEAN or SEPIA Forum. Next slide. Allow me to provide you a brief background about SEPIA. SEPIA was proposed by the Japanese government and it was welcomed by the 16th ASEAN Plus 3 meeting of energy ministers in Bangkok, Thailand on 5 September of 2019. SEPIA was established under the ASEAN Plus 3 New and Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency and Conservation Forum. And SEPTIA was envisioned to serve as a platform to facilitate collaboration between the public sector and the private sector, more on the deployment and development of cleaner energy, as well as to chart the direction for promoting low carbon technologies in Southeast Asian region. Next slide. Another background why SEPTIA was launched in 2019 is that ASEAN is one of the fastest growing economic regions in the world uh, with GDP of around uh, 3.166 trillion US dollars or growing a real GDP of 4.6% in 2019. However, uh, with the onset of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the regional economy was estimated to have contracted by 3.8% in 2020. However, the FDI uh, grew 4.9% to reach 160.6 billion US dollars in 2019. And uh, major FDI sources of ASEAN are USA, ASEAN, Japan, and the European Union. Again, with the onset of COVID-19 pandemic, it was estimated tentatively that the FDI uh, declined by 32.9% in Southeast Asia. And ASEAN is one of the most preferred investment destinations in the world. And why is it so? Because investors are seeking markets, Investors are seeking resources. Investors are seeking efficiency. And they have found ASEAN as one to have the most favorable conditions for them to put their investments for development in the ASEAN region. For one, in terms of market, ASEAN has large market size. ASEAN is about 640 million population. And ASEAN has rapid economic growth, about 5% in the past two decades. And the prospect is continued to grow because of the prospects and the promise of the ASEAN economic community, uh, where it promotes integration and connectivity. And also in the region, there is a growing middle income consumers and notably increase in spending and infrastructure to move products and uh, services seamlessly across the region. And investors are seeking resources and uh, ASEAN has favorable agroclimatic conditions. Uh, they can have access to several resources such as land and they could even uh, explore jointly on, for example, on natural resources such as oil. And of course, our investors, uh, they are seeking efficiency and ASEAN has abundant supply of low-cost and skilled labor, also supply of low-cost production inputs and strong industrial clusters which are now being seen as a common site in many countries in Southeast Asia. Next slide. And also one of the major reasons why SEPTIA was supported by the CN plus three community is because of the fact that in energy investment would come from the private sector. According to the study of IRENA in 2018, uh, renewable energy investment 
usually comes from the private sector, about 92%, and only 8% came from the public sector. In 2016, the total investment for renewable energy alone is 263 billion US dollars, and uh, it is expected to grow more. And the six ASEAN energy outlook, uh, please have a copy of that, and you would see our projection on the financial requirement in order to meet the different targets of ASEAN in the area of renewable energy, for example, and energy efficiency in conservation. Please have a copy of the six ASEAN Energy Outlook. You can download that from the ACE website. Next slide. And of course, if there is a strong private and government sector uh, going hand in hand, we would see a lot of benefits. Uh, these are to include the development of efficient policy and regulatory frameworks, enhancement and development of more opportunities in order to develop renewable energy and cleaner energy systems in Southeast Asia, uh, the introduction of new technologies and innovation. Uh, we have heard from the Vice Minister of METI that technology innovation is their core strategy for growth. Of course, in Southeast Asia, our growth strategy is sustainable development. And of course, that would also fill the financial gaps so that we could have more uh, projects realized in the area of energy efficiency and conservation and renewable energy. Next slide. Uh, this is just a background of what happened in the first septia, which was held on 27 of November 2019 in Makati City, the Philippines. It was hosted by the Department of Energy and well supported by the Secretary of DOE, with over 200 participants and speakers coming from government offices, private sector, international organizations, as well as uh, the academe. And uh, we had three sessions which are which were very uh, vital that shaped to what is SEPIA is today. Uh, we have the discussion on SEPTIA and the future potentials. Uh, we have a robust discussion on the flagship project ideas and how to realize them. And of course, the panel discussions, that's why we are here in SEPTIA, uh, SEPTIA 2. Excellent. The objectives of SEPTIA are fourfold. First, uh, it should serve as a platform to showcase the best practices, the challenges and solutions uh, to move forward or support the harmonization of the three E's, energy security, economic growth, and environmental sustainability. SEPTIA would also serve as a workplace for both the public and the private sector for them to hatch or incubate or develop cooperative projects uh, to serve the region's pursuit uh, towards energy transition and clean energy systems, as well as energy resilience. And SEPTIA is also to serve as data bank and catalyst that would attract more ideas to support the acceleration on the development and deployment of cleaner energy technologies, innovation, as well as R&D. And lastly, SEPTIA is uh, to serve as linchpin, um, which means to, to link or to bridge the private sector and the public sector to advance technology de deployment. And with that, it should be able to support the ASEAN Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation Phase 2. Next slide. And this is just a visualization of that objective. Uh, basically, uh, we would like at the end of the day, uh, this forum would be able to provide few recommendations in the areas of policy, uh, what projects to pursue in the coming years along, along the line of the APAEC, as well as to develop a partnership and investment support uh, from the private sector. Next slide. SEPTIA also supports the implementation of the APAIC Phase 2, 2021 to 25. 
during the time when SEPIA was uh, launched, we are still drafting the APAI phase two, but we see to it that the alignment is there. And the APAI phase two document was endorsed by the 38 ASEAN Ministers of Energy meeting in November of 2020. And uh, we injected a lot of global energy trends uh, in that document that would shape the energy landscape of ASEAN uh, in the period of 2021 to 2025. And this include, for example, the complementarities between the ASEAN Economic Community Blueprint and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Second is the advent of the fourth industrial revolution. The very heart of it is the digitalization in the energy sector, which is now commanding a lot of uh, changes in the way business are being carried out. It also deep dive on how ASEAN should strategize in its efforts to realize energy transition uh, and, of course, on how to move forward with its economic growth and to ensure that the, uh, the impact of COVID-19 is mitigated and that uh, there would be uh, that ASEAN is ready to implement sustainable uh, COVID recovery plans. And the APAIC Phase 2, we retain the theme as in APAIC Phase 1, which is enhancing energy connectivity and market integration in ASEAN in order to achieve energy security, accessibility, affordability, and sustainability for all. And we added the sub-theme, which is accelerating energy transition and strengthening energy resilience and we will do that through greater innovation and cooperation. So dialogue partners and international organizations will play a key role uh, in achieving the goals of the APAI phase two. Next slide. And uh, just to share with you uh, the key strategies for APAI phase two, you can see on the slide, but because of the limited time, I will just focus on program area number four and program area number five, uh, which are the key interests of SEPTIA. So program area number four is energy efficiency and conservation, where in the key strategy is to reduce energy intensity by 32% by 2025, and to encourage more energy efficiency and conservation efforts, focusing more on transport and industry. And for program area number five, which is renewable energy, the key strategy of ASEAN is to increase the share of renewable energy in total primary energy supply by at least 23% and 35% share of renewable energy in installed power capacity by 2025. Next slide. And now I would like to mention some of the key recommendations of the first step here. Yeah? The first recommendation was to support the APAE targets on energy efficiency and renewable energy uh, through the following activities. The first activity would be to conduct knowledge sharing and best practices on clean energy and to focus more on policies, uh, technology, financing, investment, uh, research, development, and demonstration. And after this, uh, we should be able to identify potential collaboration and activities and to look into uh, the role of cluster partnership as well as to engage incubator programs uh, which are now multiplying in several nations of the world. And this recommendation should be able to provide uh, some support for policy projects and partnership and investment for renewable energy and energy efficiency aligned with the APAIC phase two. Next slide. The second recommendation of SEPIA is to report in this meeting in the second uh, SEPIA forum uh, the potential flagship projects. And these potential flagship projects that were identified are as follows. The first one is the zero energy building to support the energy transition. And the ASEAN Center for Energy was able to launch a subcategory of zero energy building in the ASEAN Energy Awards. 
Second is the optimization control or the Rentai initiative in order to promote energy efficiency in factories or industries in their operations. The third one is more deployment and the development of renewable energy such as the microgrid technologies and we can see already uh, some developments in these microgrid technologies uh, being installed in Southeast Asian nations. And the fourth one is to promote corporate value to promote climate actions and energy, environmental, social, corporate governance. And of course, the alignment with the directives of the APAIC phase two 2021 to 2025. And the second, sec third recommendation is to, to complete the draft statement of the first CFEA. And hopefully this mission statement will be uh, finalized uh, this year. And of course, uh, our second CFEA forum, uh, we have provided you a very good program for today. And uh, you would see a lot of uh, discussion, including the progress made on the different flagship projects. And in this forum today, uh, we will be discussing two new flagship projects, which are cleaner finance and high efficiency mobile air conditioners. And there will be a lot of discussion on the area of mobilization of finance for decarbonization pathways. And there is at the sideline of this uh, second CPEA forum would be the signing of MOC between the Vice President of the Asian Development Bank and the Vice Minister of the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan. So I think uh, this is a very exciting uh, second CPEA forum and we do hope that the 300 registered participants, but I heard that we are over 150 right now, uh, we would you would be able to enjoy and to learn insights from this forum so stay tuned and please don't go away thank you for your kind attention back to you Alfred. thank you very much mr christopher for your insightful presentation we will now move to our next session on the presentation of the stefia flagship projects I would like to invite Mr. Takahashi Koji, Deputy Director, Global Environment Partnership Office, Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry Japan, to deliver the presentation regarding the overview of activities. Mr. Takahashi Koji, please, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for your introduction. And uh, I'm uh, Koji Takahashi from METI. And uh, uh, today, uh, I will um, briefly present the, uh, uh, the flagship uh, project, project overview of flagship project and the introduction of this session. Next slide, please. Now, this is an uh, overview of flagship activities. Here, uh, we, say, uh, we see uh, the flagship project under the CEFIA is a project to which uh, key components are applied uh, throughout the implementation. And uh, as you see uh, in the CEFIA, uh, key, key components, uh, so we have three key components, and low carbon technology and uh, institution or regulatory frameworks. And the final third one is finance. And, uh, and the flagship project, uh, some uh, projects have been implemented by mainly by Japanese companies that uh, they have uh, partnership with uh, their partners with uh, in the ASEAN countries. And the uh, outcomes of flagship project uh, shared and discussed in this uh, forum and annually and uh, for further development. And of course, as I uh, uh, presented uh, Mr. Christopher Zamora, uh, contribution to the APAIC goals is considered implementation of the flagship project. And here now we have uh, kinds of, so far we have three potential key sectors as you see, energy efficiency and renewable energy and the cross-cutting area. But uh, we have uh, considering uh, the one more new uh, sector and so is the finance. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the uh, outcome of the, the first uh, CEPIA forum. Uh, this uh, the first forum was held uh, in November uh, 2019. So uh, it is was uh, more than one year ago. And then and uh, the following uh, we see and uh, the three uh, project uh, was uh, presented as uh, a candidate uh, project of uh, Safeyard flagship. So far you can see uh, zero energy uh, zero energy uh, pro building project and uh, autom automatic control technology for plant and other facilities, so called Lenke project, and the renewable energy hybrid microgrid solution with the Typhoon Plu with wind turbine. And plus, uh, the way uh, uh, we uh, explained uh, TCFD, uh, the concept of TCFD, and then. And uh, next slide, please. And today uh, here, uh, this, see, this is the list of presentation here. Today's and uh, as, I, as I explained, uh, we have already three uh, flagship projects, Linke, Zev, and the microgrid uh, project. They have uh, some, pro uh, of course, they have made uh, uh, much uh, progress, and uh, they have uh, this project uh, progress will be presented later by the experts. And uh, we have plus uh, we have uh, new, uh, two new ideas of flagship project. The one needs uh, uh, one needs a uh, finance, and the second is uh, high efficiency mobile air conditioners. Um, particularly uh, finance, uh, we have uh, uh, experts. I uh, will make present, uh, presentation later, and uh, uh, of course, uh, plus uh, we have uh, one more a sp specific session of finance. So, so uh, you can find, uh, you, you can understand the our idea of finance. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the uh, outline. Uh, this is the uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the outline of the each uh, flagship uh, project. But the uh, expert will make a presentation later uh, in the detail. Also, I will uh, briefly uh, explain very shortly. And the first one is a uh, Linke project. So, uh, as you can see the seed, a uh, Linke project is a uh, kind of uh, automatic uh, controlling system uh, in the manufacturing unit uh, to, in, to improve uh, the energy efficiency in the unit. Next slide, please. This is our dev project, uh, zero energy building. This is a project for to improve, of course, uh, energy efficiency in the uh, in the building uh, as well as well. Next slide, please. This is a microgrid energy system, and uh, this is a kind of combination of technology, and not only uh, for not only renewable energy. But also other uh, technologies, uh, storage on the EV or some IT. And uh, th this is the three projects uh, that was have already implemented so far. And next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a new idea of Safe Yard uh, flagship project. Uh, first one is finance. Now the direction of activities is uh, two. Uh, we have two activities uh, two, in two directions. One is enhancing uh, regional capability to attract clean energy finance. And the second one is uh, developing a collaboration platform to accelerating clean energy finance. And this, is, uh, uh, this uh, will be explained later by experts. The next slide, please. The final, uh, final one is a high efficient uh, mobile air conditioner, HA8MAC. Uh, this is a uh, kind of, uh, uh, this of uh, uh, and of course uh, to upgrade and the energy efficiency in the for in the air conditioner, and this uh, means uh, to reduce uh, finally lead uh, reduce CO2 emissions uh, by using uh, the by utilizing the air conditioners. 
And this is kind of uh, this uh, project goal is kind of uh, is uh, by uh, is all win-win by partnership with uh, not all, uh, between public press sector and the private sector. And next slide. And this is the all of my presentation. And uh, today uh, I expect the audience of uh, this uh, forum to uh, understand more. Uh, this uh, about the uh, Cepheid Flask project by uh, experts' uh, presentation and uh, followed by my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Takahashi Koji, for delivering the overview of activities. Before I invite uh, our next presenter, I would like to kindly remind all of the participants to utilize the question function in the control panel of the GoToWebinar if you have any questions, so you can directly ask your questions to the presenters. Now, I would like to kindly invite Dr. David Banjer Pongchai, Professor of Chula Longkorn University, Thailand, to deliver the presentation on activities of Renke. Dr. David, please, the time is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm highly uh, honored to present the activities that uh, progress of the CPR and K control flagship projects. I am myself affiliated with the Department of Electrical Engineering, Faculty of Xinjurang University. And this work is partly with the joint collaboration with uh, JEDA. Okay. Next slide, please. The outline of my talk will start from the Renke control flagship projects and then uh, give you some highlight on the technology, some activities in the 2020, and then the future plan for 2021. Next slide, please. About the Renke control flagship projects. Next slide. Uh, this is a joint corporation between industry, uh, university, and the governments. Okay. The industry mainly from the Japanese company uh, led by the Japan Electronics Information Technology Industry Association. Um, and then the university that consists of three universities, Jurong Kwan University from Thailand, Bandung Institute of Technology in Indonesia, and the Hanoi uh, Technology for Science and Technology in Vietnam. And then we also have a support from Waseda University. Uh, for the government sectors, okay, we collaborate with the S uh, and also the Ministry of uh, Economic Trade and uh, Industry in Japan. So the purpose of the Renke Control Flagship Project is uh, to collaborate okay, among these identities to boost up the energy efficiency in ASEAN countries. Okay, so our activity consists of the survey of the potential greenhouse gas reduction, the policy and incentive to disseminate the linkage control. And then we will move on for the feasibility studies and the pilot projects in the coming years. And then we also promote uh, this linkage control to the government sectors by introducing the technology of the advanced controls, uh, share the policy of the best practice, in uh in Japan in in around the world and then we would like to report the updates progress to the government sectors next slide please next slide uh for the linkage control technologies okay this is uh, uh the for the existing uh distributed control systems okay we can build upon it uh, is a software which can optimize the operation of the utilities as well as the manufacturing process in the factories. Okay, by obtaining the data, we can optimize okay the uh, the performance like the energy usage and also meeting the requirements of the uh, productions. The key characteristics of the linkage control is a uh, low cost, is a uh, quick, okay, and is also flexible. Uh, we we, from our experience, okay, it's a time frame for developed uh, linkage control for the industry is about three to six months. Next slide, please. And the linkage control technology is a, to uh, balance between the uh, supply size and the demand size. 
Okay. And as you can see that the, for the supply side, there are various sources of the energies like electricity and gas and fuels. Okay. And you have a lot of uh, facilities, uh, equipment like it can be chiller, air compressor, okay, absorption chillers, co-generation. How would you reutilize all these uh, facility units, okay, to meet the demand of the, uh, the production size? Okay, on the demand size, uh, Renke control also can help to minimize, okay, the peak load, uh, and that can uh, reduce the cost as well as the uh, in-house gas reductions. And then the goal here is uh, to balance between the demand size and the supply size. Next slide, please. So the activity in 2020 start from the webinars. Next slide. So we conducted uh, four webinars, okay, for the capacity buildings. The main target is uh, to share the know-how of the link control to the next generations, okay, engineers, okay. The first workshop would be on the introduction of CPA, API, and digital transformation and instrumentation. And this is uh, carried out by the expert from uh, METI, S, uh, from Professor Amano, and also from the friends from ASPIL Corporation. And the second day is a uh, introduction of the linkage control, the policy, okay, the subsidy policy in Japan, okay, by colleagues from Yokogawa Electrics. Okay, and then the last one is a special lecture by the Professor Amano introduced the energy management system at the Chijuku IND Center at Waseda University. Next slide, please. And then workshop number three, okay, is an introduction of the feasibility studies and the hands-on trainings, okay, uh, that is carried out by uh, colleagues from SPU Corporation. And then the last one, the last le webinar is a potential survey and a special lecture on the supervisory modality control of air conditioning systems that are uh, given by myself, okay. We conduct these uh, four webinars, okay, for the student in Thailand during the September and also for the student in Indonesia, Vietnam, okay, in September and October. Next slide, please. Next, uh, we'd like to talk about the potential survey, which is the highlight of the activity in 2020. Next slide. Um, from our survey of the energy policy and planning office uh, statistics, okay, we focus on five industries, food, beverage, textile, chemical, paper, and non-metallics. Okay, the total energy consumption in 2019 is a uh, 16,000 uh, kiloton oil equivalents, okay. For the T CO2 emissions, okay, from these five industrial sector that we calculate, okay, based on the energy data in 2019, is the amount of uh, 72 uh, kiloton CO2. And uh, the, the amount of this uh, is, uh, is quite uh, um, portions more than 50% of the industry sectors in Thailand. Next slide, please. And then from the experience of the Japanese uh, experts say that the linkage control can reduce around the 3% of energy consumption. That is also equivalent to the 3% of CO2 emission in target facilities, such as a utility generation facility, okay, through the operation optimizations. And then we would like to aim for the 3%, okay, for the energy consumptions, okay, for the target of the uh, API, okay. So let, let us move on to the next slide. Um, so for the, the total energy consumption of the target utilities in uh, Thailand in year 2020, 19, as I mentioned, okay, for the five sectors is accumulate of 9,000 kiloton equivalents, okay, and if you calculate 3% of uh, energy reduction would be equal to 282 kiloton oil equivalents, okay, and that when, when you uh, multiply with the CO2 emission ratios, okay, the amount of the um, total CO2 emissions 
that uh, based on the energy consumption in 2019 is a uh, 72 uh, kiloton CO2, and then uh, with with this amount of the uh, expected okay uh, related to the target facility is a uh, 33 uh, thousand uh, ton kiloton CO2. Now the potential reduction based on the Renke control okay for this amount is a uh, 1,000 kiloton CO2. Next slide, please. Uh, next, uh, we will project okay, uh, the potential contribution of Renke control in Thailand okay, for, for the master plans. Okay. The target of energy saving in 2036 will be uh, 51 kiloton TO, TOE. Okay. Uh, as as you can see that the as you can see the the targets of the uh, amount of these reductions okay would be based on the promoting the energy efficiencies okay to to this project and that uh, equivalent to the uh, some some would be based on the electricities and some would be on the heat okay consumptions. So how we can make this happen, okay, for, for this uh, energy reductions. Okay, let's move on to the next slides. So the, the first plans that we are looking at is the uh, enforcement of energy conservation standard in the design and factory buildings. Okay, so the amount of the targets of uh, EED, EEDP plan 2015 is a uh, uh, 4,000 uh, kiloton TOE, all right? So I, I believe that the Renke control can contribute to this uh, EE1 plant to help the designated factory industry tech sector to achieve that energy conservation target plans. Next slide, please. Uh, so we will calculate okay the possible contribution of the Lenke control in Thailand. Okay, uh, recap okay the the figure from year two thousand nineteen. Okay, if we apply the Lenke control to the industrial sectors, major industrial sector, we can save up to two hundred eighty two kilotons. Okay, uh, so we project into year uh, two thousand thirty six. Okay. So we calculate the amount of uh, uh, that total energy consumptions that can be saved. Okay, that would be equivalent to um, six hundred sixteen euro ton or equivalents. Okay, so if you figure out this amount of the savings, okay. Okay, we, we say that it will take into account of 14% of the targets, okay, savings. So I believe that the Lenke control can contribute a significant amount of uh, energy saving as well as the greenhouse gas reductions. Next slide, please. So the activity plan for the next years, okay. Um, next slide. So in year 2020, we have uh, finished okay, the uh, capacity buildings uh, for the first Lenke control. Okay. We will continue with this uh, uh, seminars and uh, Lenke uh, discussions. And then in the second year to 2021, we will focus on the uh, feasibility studies, okay, which means that we will select uh, the potential uh, factories and then we will do the details, uh, energy statistics, and also uh, requires uh, some of the uh, information about their systems, uh, facility systems. And then in year 2022, okay, we will implement uh, for our pilot projects. Okay, and this have to be in a collaboration between the uh, control suppliers, uh, academias, industry, and the governments. Next slide, please. Okay. 
uh, let, let me explain once more again, okay, the activity that will happen, okay, we will carry out the detailed facility studies by choosing the factories uh, to estimate the potential CO2 reductions of the linkage control, okay, they will be the fundamentals for the pilot project in the third year. Okay, as part of the capacity buildings, okay, the student will be learn and take part in these uh, feasibility studies so that they can learn okay, the professionals uh, feasibility studies as well as uh, technology. And then last one is that we will continue to uh, hold the seminars okay, to submit the ranking control for the industry students for the government. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. David, for your presentation. I would like to kindly invite Mr. Yamamoto Katsuhiko, General Manager, Japanese Business Alliance for Smart Energy Worldwide. Mr. Yamamoto Katsuhiko, please, the time is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Katsuhiko Yamamoto. I belong to the organization called Japanese Business Alliance for Smart Energy Worldwide. In short, JSW, we call us JSW. Okay. So it's my honor to talk here. Can I continue? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, our activities in order to disseminate zero energy building, in short, ZEB, uh, in ASEAN member countries. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, firstly, why zero energy building now? Uh, this graph shows world energy consumption in 2017, uh, according to the data from uh, IEA, International Energy Agency. 29% uh, of total energy consumption was occupied by the buildings. Such a huge part of uh, consumption. Uh, besides the building which currently have been built, constructed will remain 2050 because of its long lifetime. And our goal should be zero energy because we are aiming for the decarbonized society. But, it looks difficult to make the, the energy buildings. Uh, this is okay. So we proposed step-by-step -step approach towards ZEB. Usually ZEB means that drastically reduced energy consumption and offsetting remaining energy consumption by renewable energy. But we expanded the definition of ZEB uh, like this, uh, net ZEB, ZEB, and nearly ZEB, which are currently uh, mentioned, and ZEB ready. Uh, we call this ZEB uh, family concept. Right now, uh, especially in ASEAN countries, a lot of buildings are, are being constructed and increasing day by day. So if you uh, pursue net zero energy building from the beginning, there are many difficulties on finance or technologies in order to realize it. However, once if you plan and design the building with this clear concept of the ZEB family concept, you can realize net ZEB through the step-by-step -step approach starting from ZEB ready. ZEB ready buildings can be designed, constructed, and operated by use of not only advanced technologies, but also other existing materials, equipment with measurement, verification, and management in not only advanced countries, but also emerging countries. Our organization is an alliance which consists of many private companies such as Daikin, Mitsubishi, AGC, and so on. 
and supported by Japanese government, Meiji. So we are public-private partnership organization. We believe that realizing ZEB in ASEAN countries requires awareness raising, sharing of experience, uh, return to return to the slide. A uh, previous one, slide please. Yes. Awareness raising and sharing of experience and know-how and support for making policies and guidelines towards the EB. Next slide, please. Uh, in order to promote awareness raising and sharing of no experience know-how of the EB in ASEAN countries, we have been conducting ZEB training programs and workshop and seminars. We had invited people from ASEAN 10 countries to participate ZEB training program in Tokyo. And also we held seminars or workshops with the countries we got requests from. Last year, because of COVID-19 pandemic, we could not go abroad, but we held seminars through the online programs to Vietnam, Malaysia, and right yesterday and today in Indonesia. Next slide, please. Uh, for your reference, in Japan, in order to raise awareness, ZEB pamphlets are available. In order to share knowledge and know-how, ZEB design guidelines are available. Uh, we can give you an English translated version for your reference. Especially, uh, next slide, please. Especially in Malaysia, we have concluded Memorandum of uh, Understanding, MOU, two years ago. Since then, we have been communicating. And at the end of the last year, we had a seminar in order to establish ZEB design guideline in Malaysia. Now they are making their own guideline for ZEB. Next slide, please. Uh, we think in order to promote ZEB, firstly, we thought we need an internationally recognized idea for ZEB. So we are now making international standard for ZEB step-by-step -step approach. We proposed this approach in September 2018 to ISO, International Organization for Standardization. We have been actively proceeding this technical specification together with ASEAN countries, such as Singapore, Malaysia, and Philippines. And now the final ballot for issuing this approach as a TS23764, this ballot will be closed on February 12th soon. So now uh, we expect this technical standard can get an international agreement soon. Based on this standard, you can develop your own policies and measurements adapting your country situation. Next slide, please. Uh, you can go through, yeah. Yes. Uh, please up to six. Uh, there are six core elements of TS23764. I will not explain in the details, but I would like to say that this document describes the basic concept from the planning stage to after completion. Uh, once published, you can review and this utilize this document. Uh, this is okay. Uh, one of the topics last year is ASEAN Energy Awards. Last year, uh, two cases are awarded. One is from Singapore. The other one is from uh, Malaysia. Uh, congratulations. These are inspiring achievement for ASEAN countries. So in order to promote ZEB in ASEAN countries, we can be the catalyst. Most important point is policies and measurements for disseminate ZEB. Let us support your policy making 
and measures for disseminating ZEB in your country. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Katsuhiko Yamamoto, for your presentation on zero energy building. I would like to kindly invite Mr. Tetsuya Saito, Manager, International Environment Department, Consulting Operation Headquarters of Nippon Koi Company Limited. Mr. Tetsuya Saito, please, the time and floor is yours. Thank you very much for kind introduction. My name is Saito Tetsuya in charge of climate change and renewable energy in International Environment Department of Nippon Koe. Today, let me present the progress of flagship project on microgrid. Next, please. First of all, I would like to uh, briefly touch the uh, energy access information. Uh, minimum access has been improved in already and uh, eight ASEAN countries have more than 85 percent of electricity access so far while increase of demand will be still expected considering annual electricity consumption per capita is below two megawatt hour in seven countries in islands and remote areas uh, where uh, microgrid is most the most needed most electricity is from fossil fuel and electric energy costs tends to be higher and the uh, introduction of renewables are uh, also uh, progressed in these uh, remote islands, but this, uh, this sometimes uh, ends up with the uh, fluctuation, uh, which sometimes uh, lowers the quality of the electricity supply in the island. So uh, reliable and aff affordable energy is very important as a sustainable development goal. And I believe that microgrid is uh, one of the uh, key uh, for the solution. Next, please. So this is a potential market size of rural electrification by 2030 in ASEAN regions. We can see uh, the urgent needs of electricity uh, electrification is still big. And we understand uh, that together with technology, uh, finance and regulatory and policy measures are also important uh, for promotion of microgrid. Next, please. So, uh, Nippon Koe uh, is Japan's uh, number one international engineering consultant, and we have offices and group companies in most of ASEAN countries. And these are the, uh, some of the uh, example which we are currently uh, engaged uh, in the microgrid projects. And in Japan, we promote resilient community energy use uh, with community uh, energy management system developed by us. Next, please. So then uh, we'd like to uh, present uh, the real uh, project implementation uh, with uh, firstly uh, the technical uh, feasibility study uh, currently undergoing in Batanes Island of Philippines. So this uh, project is aiming to uh, install resilient microgrid with Typhoon Torelant wind turbine, PV, battery, uh, all controlled by EMS and uh, with the support of NEDO and METI. And this is this project is led by uh, Chal Energy, uh, who is a manufacturer of this wind turbine, and also uh, with the support uh, and collaboration with Kyushu Electric Power Transmission and Distribution, Soji Philippines, and also Nippon Koe. Next, please. So as I pointed, that uh, technology, finance, and the regulatory and policy measures are important uh, regarding this project. Uh, from the technology point of view, this typhoon-proof wind turbine, the, as shown in this uh, photo, this vertical uh, Magnus-type uh, wind turbine can be tolerant for the very high velocity of the wind speed. Then it can uh, generate uh, uh, electricity even in the typhoon uh, attacking time. And also uh, EMS uh, will enable efficient and resilient uh, supply of electricity to the uh, microgrid. Then regarding finance, uh, through study and demonstration uh, project, uh, we would like to uh, 
appropriately select the combination technologies uh, which best fits the island uh, situation and to uh, improve the cost efficiency and reduce uh, capex and opex and then of course this is uh, with to be supported uh, current uh, fs is supported by nedo and the demonstration project uh, if it is approved uh, also to be support supported by uh, nedo jcm scheme then through this uh, project we would like to identify the true cost of power generation uh, with the life cycle assessment then regarding regulations uh, through the project uh, we need to we understand we need to improve uh, this long and uh, complicated procedures for microgrid project since uh, even for the smaller uh, microgrid project currently uh, the uh, the permission process is very uh, similar and basically the same uh, with a large scale uh, grid project so the we need to uh, identify the improvement point through this uh, project and to be to discuss this issue with the Philippine side uh, for the uh, more extension of the microgrid uh, technologies. Next please. Then secondly, I'd like to present uh, one project in Maldives. This is not the project in ASEAN region, of course, uh, but uh, since it mobilized the finance of Japan Fund for Joint Crediting Mechanism or JFJCM of uh, ADB. So this can be this finance scheme can be applied in many ASEAN countries. So I hope this will also be interesting for all the participants. Then this project is now installing EMS and BES, uh, EMS and Battery Energy Management System a storage system to one of the islands of Maldives. Next, please. Regarding technology, advanced energy management system and battery energy storage system uh, can enable maximum use of solar energy and also the higher efficiency of existing generators. Actually, in the current situation, only PV is installed and the fluctuation of PV actually makes the uh, existing generators run at not efficient range and even uh, uh, to uh, increase uh, the greenhouse gas emission. So uh, the microgrid uh, technologies are very uh, important for the uh, stabilization and also better uh, management of the energy. And regarding finance, uh, this is a uh, uh, JFJCM support uh, with the uh, uh, connected uh, ADB project on the PV installation. Then uh, regarding regulations, it is also uh, with related to the finance uh, uh, perspective, but uh, uh, in the tender process, the Maldivian Maldive uh, government uh, decided to improve the evaluation uh, system. And then they uh, decided uh, to evaluate the uh, life cycle cost of the, the system. So for example, like uh, if there's a, a change and maintenance uh, of the system in the remote islands, of course, it is always uh, costly. So that uh, to, to have uh, less number of the maintenance uh, needs, uh, we've also uh, evaluated in this uh, project. Next, please. So from here, I would like to explain uh, a few projects on the, uh, the ASEAN countries uh, under study. So first one in uh, Myanmar, the triple hybrid e-block system controlled uh, by EMS and uh, battery uh, with also the generator uh, and renewable energy can uh, contribute to grid stabilization and power resource management and optimum control battery. As seen, as seen in this uh, figure, uh, the cost reduction uh, of the fuel consumption will be much bigger uh, with uh, more utilization, uh, optimum utilization of the renewable power. And uh, uh, it is also hoped that currently this system is designed with uh, uh, gas and diesel 
engines, but in the future, uh, generators will run with the uh, hydrogen 100%, which can be also uh, green hydrogen uh, to uh, contribute to the zero carbon society. Next, please. And this is another microgrid project in Indonesia. Uh, the H21 system, a uh, hybrid electricity storage system by battery and hydrogen, uh, is now under study to be installed in one of the islands uh, near Jakarta. So this uh, will utilize uh, renewable energy from solar uh, sources. And uh, to, for the short-term fluctuations, uh, it can be absorbed and mitigated by the battery system. And then long-term fluctuation or bulk surplus can be converted into hydrogen and uh, it will be converted again when it's necessary uh, through fuel cell. Next, please. Then this is another project in Vietnam. So regarding zero carbon smart zone concept. So they are targeting uh, one of the city or uh, industrial park or that kind of uh, the the development areas uh, with the renewable energy battery and EV and EMS so there uh, these uh, companies are famous for AI management so the, the they control EMS with AI and also they control the buses EV buses uh, with the AI and automated drives so it can these EVs can be also served as a battery and uh, it can uh, stabilize the, the renewable energy grid uh, in the city or the industrial parks next please so through these projects and studies we i would like to just briefly summarize some important points for promotion of microgrid so firstly uh, shortening and easing uh, permission process is very important and flexible coordination with grid companies are uh, the always important and currently always difficult issues in many countries and relaxation of restriction sometimes uh, for uh, the automated driving of the EV bus or this telecommunication issues sometimes uh, a barrier and then uh, regarding financial issues evaluation of like cycle cost including uh, greenhouse gas emission and also resilience of this microgrid uh, to be uh, studied and also it should be somewhat uh, evaluated uh, with the financial perspective then uh, we also have to uh, value that uh, uh, the microgrid can contribute to the local production and use of energy which can reduce that uh, the uh, the money uh, flows out to the uh, flows out from the area and flows out from the country next please so this is uh, my final slide so more and more implementation of demonstration project uh, will will really clarify benefit and barriers of a microgrid project extension so, and the uh, government can re uh, play very important role for realizing microgrid project by promoting enabling environment especially on finance and regulations so thank you very much and i'm looking forward to uh, implementing more and more microgrid projects uh, with everybody interested so please uh, communicate uh, with us uh, if you are interested in any of the uh, technologies shown uh, so that uh, we can uh, really uh, introduce uh, more and more uh, affordable and reliable electricity supply. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Saito Tetsuya, for your presentation on the microgrid projects. Now we will hear two presentations on new flagship project candidates under the Sefia platform. For this, I would like to kindly invite Ms. Nanet Abiasong, head of Atvia Finance and Investment Center, Association of Development Financing Institutions in Asia and the Pacific, or the Atvia. Ms. Nanet, please, the time is yours.
Good morning, Ms. Nanette. Can you hear my voice? Uh, we cannot hear Thank you. Thank you again Continue. for the kind introduction. Yes, I, I can hear you, Alfred. Okay. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers and hosts of the second CEPIA Forum for inviting ATIAP and be given an opportunity to talk about our idea on the ASEAN-wide collaboration on cleaner finance. Before I begin my presentation, allow me to give a brief introduction of who ATIAP is. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. ADFIAP is the Association of Development Financing Institutions in Asia and the Pacific. It is a regional organization composed of 87 development banks and other financial institutions in 36 countries in Asia and the Pacific region. It was founded in 1976 during the ADB Conference for DFIs. Next slide, please. ADPF's mission is to advance sustainable development financing through the projects and programs of its members. We provide advisory training and consultancy on sustainable financing, SDG funding and ESG frameworks, risk management and other bank operations. We are also into deal making activities and blended finance arrangements. Okay, uh, the slide that is shown now would uh, is actually the ASEAN wide our proposal for the ASEAN-wide collaboration on cleaner finance. It's a flagship, a proposed flagship project of CEPIA, and it is premised on the following. Financing is one of ASEAN's key challenges in achieving a low-carbon economy. Banks play a crucial role in mobilizing finance. However, there are major issues and bottlenecks which we need to understand to be able to propose solutions and encourage financing and investments. Collaboration and partnerships among relevant organizations from public and private sectors and at both country and regional levels are necessary. A roadmap of activities for SOFIA can be done to ensure a continuous flow of resources and support more sustainable activities in the low carbon business. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, well, SOFIA has been discussed earlier and why was it created, but I'm walking you through again on this very quickly because the role of SEFIA is very significant for the proposed ASEAN-wide collaboration. Its objectives and promotional themes are well-placed and directed to accelerating cleaner energy finance. The objective of SEFIA is twofold to promote business-driven dissemination of cleaner energy and low-carbon technologies in the ASEAN region and function as a hub for collaborative mechanisms and strong cooperation among members to facilitate cleaner energy finance. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. As a hub, as a hub, it functions to revolve on four promotional, promotional themes to showcase and share and communicate good practices, challenges, and solutions. Second, as a work pay, workspace to carry out cooperative projects and activities like feasibility study preparation, demonstration projects, and capacity building. As a data bank to collect information, data, and reports. And lastly, to catalyze on policy development and improvement institutional development, partnerships to connect people and organizations for technology deployment and financing. Next slide, please. Can we show the next slide, please? Can we show the next slide, please? Uh, Ms. Nanette, I think uh, there is a delay. Uh, I'm right sorry, now I cannot share you. my... 
I cannot uh, show the next slide. So can you do that? Yes. Yes, uh, right now it is showing the slide. Oh, all about right, okay. The... So, the slide on my screen is the promotional theme. Is that the same as uh, your screen also? Uh, right now it is showing the way forward, uh, the slide about way forward. Uh, Ms. Dinta, can you uh, go back one slide? I think it's the previous slide. Um, right now it is showing the slides on activities and major issues. Is it the correct uh, slide? I can, my... Good, thank you. Um, can you move one slide back, please? Can you move one slide back, please? Okay, thank you. Oh, this uh, this slide would show the activities that has been um, that has been one. Next slide, please. Okay. So these are the activities um, that have been done that has that has been carried out by Sophia for the for the past uh, for the since 2019, and and these activities would show several uh, have identified several issues which need to be addressed. The first activity was the first uh, Sophia Forum in November 2019. It was held in Manila. And during the forum, it was raised that policy and institutional framework were major bottlenecks in financing, that the policy and framework must be reviewed to check for effectiveness and that measures for system improvement must be integrated into the policy. The next activity was a virtual roundtable discussion held uh, last year in September. Um, this, the purpose of this virtual roundtable is to map out the landscape of cleaner energy finance and to check the challenges faced by the financial sector on a macro level standpoint. It discussed the initiatives being done by the NDBs like ADB and IFC and organizations like ACE, the ASEAN Bankers Association, PFAN, and ADFIA. During the discussion, the major bottlenecks identified were the lack of capacity building, the need for support on policy and technology, and problem on availability of appropriate financing instruments. Issues on project specifics like return on investments, business matching, and showcasing of successful projects were also raised. Currently ongoing is a survey and study on gap analysis to provide a deeper perspective of the problems of the financial sector and determine actual experiences of the development banks and the commercial banks, including state-owned guarantee fund and SME funds. The study hopes to digest the needs of the banks and the kind of support needed by them, whether it be on policy improvement, training, tools and measurement, especially on GHG emission, and even on the rollout of financing facilities. The results of the study with the proposed uh, solutions will be disseminated in March. Next slide, please. Okay, having identified some of the major bottlenecks in the earlier activities of uh, CEFIA, and as a way forward, the approach to the ASEAN-wide collaboration flagship project must be multidimensional to cover not only measures of individual countries, but also that of the region. Multi-stakeholder partnerships are also necessary among the public and private sectors and in the financial and non-financial sectors. Details of the activities to be undertaken by CEFIA within this ASEAN-wide framework will be fine-tuned based on the results of the survey. We initially see the preparation of a roadmap to align the directions of policies and implement coherent measures among the stakeholders. Existing regulatory policies and frameworks 
of the government and the central bank can be tweaked to serve as reference and guide for the region. On an institutional level, support can be given on capacity building and human resource development and conduct deep dive workshops. Guidance tools and measurement of GHG admission on the projects that banks finance or will finance should also be provided to effectively track and measure carbon uh, footprint of the portfolio. Technology deployment will also be effective as well through the promotion of proven technologies and solutions, including business matching with reliable partners. Next slide, please. A knowledge sharing platform in the region should, all be, should also be strengthened for a continuous exchange and sharing of ideas, solutions, business models, as well as access to a database for information, data, and reports. And lastly, in the long term, since the issue on financing instruments was also brought up as an area to consider, perhaps a SEFIA finance facility in the region can be established. The regional fund can provide countries with financing facilities under blended financing arrangements. A technical advisory support component shall also be included in the regional fund. This ends my presentation. This is my last slide. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Nanette, for your insightful presentation. Now I would like to kindly invite Mr. Pradip Mahasaksiri, Director, Technical Center of Denso, Thailand Company Limited. Mr. Pradip, please, the time and course is yours. Yes. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Pradit Mahasaksili from Denso Corporation in Thailand. It's my great honor to be one of the panelists today. On this occasion, I would like to present about the high efficiency mobile air conditioning system, also called HMAX, and what makes it as important tool for the CO2 reduction in transportation sectors. Next slide, please. And this is a project outline. As we know that the greenhouse gas emission reduction has become very important mission for all global communities. We know that the transportation sector generate one of the largest share of the emission to the environment every year. So we then so as a world leading automotive component, uh, would like to contribute to this uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction by developing the high efficiencies uh, mobile air count or so-called HMAC, which would be able to reduce the CO2 emission approximately 24.2% uh, compelling with the conventional systems. From now on, I'm going to present is in a little bit more in details. Next slide, please. Next. First of all, please allow me to introduce our company profiles. Uh, Vidensos are the world's second largest automotive company and suppliers. It to be just in uh, 1949, and now we have our operation all over the world, which employ more than 170,000 employees worldwide. Next slide, please. Our main products consist of four pillars. On the upper left side, as you can see, the thermal system or the mobile air conditioning system business, which I'm going to present our view today. And the next is the powertrain and electrification products. And the last, we also uh, produce the mobility system and the electronic component as well. Next slide, please. Next. This page shows our effort and corresponds in the greenhouse gas reduction with the uh, global leading markets, such as in the US. Uh, we are collaborating with the OEMs to promote the high efficiency uh, mobile air count to acquire the CO2 off cycle credit. Why we are also establishing the test and evaluation method for the HMAC, as well as the promoting eco friendly refrigerant in Europe. In Thailand, 
uh, we have attributed the joint collaboration with KMUTT University and Ministry of Energy to study the effective of HMAC on the CO2 reduction in hot climate countries since 2017. Next slide, please. We know that we all live in the tropical climate region, so the air conditioning system, both for households and automotive fields, is inevitable a product to provide comfortables. So the mobile air con uh, generates the large amount of CO2 emission to the environment. Next slide, please. And this page shows how mobile aircon impacts on the CO2 emission, especially in the transportation sectors uh, in the uh, tropical uh, hot country like in Thailand. As you can see on the upper right side, the aircon compressors are installed with the engine. So it's directly run on the engine powers and consume a lot of energy. On the lower picture show the CO2 emission due to the mobile aircon power consumption. As you can see that in Japan, the mobile aircon consumption emits only uh, emits CO2 only 280 kilogram per one car in one year. But due to the hot climate, high operation of the uh, mobile aircon and the longer mileage in Thailand, and the Results of CO2 emission from the uh, max consumption is eight times higher than those in Japan, or approximately 2,200 kilograms of CO2. So we would like to develop and promote the HMAC uh, to reduce the CO2 emission. Next slide, please. Next. In ASEAN communities, uh, we have committed to reduce the greenhouse gas emission. For example, in Thailand, plan to reduce up to 25% by 2030. To contribute to these clean policies, uh, then so we will reduce the CO2 emission by promoting the two ideas of high efficiency mobile air cons. The first one is to optimizing the performance of air conditioning system and reduce the fuel consumption by half. And the second is to manage the energy consumption in car. Next slide, please. And did you know that the mobile aircon are the second largest energy consumer in car? That in tropical country and heavy traffic jams like in ASEAN, it may consume up to almost 30% of fuels, while in battery EV car, the air con system may reduce the battery length by up to 50%. Next slide, please. And this is shows uh, how we improve the uh, efficiency of mobile air con. We have replaced this the conventional mobile air con system by applying the two high efficiency products, which is the first one, uh, the high efficiency compressors, as you can see in the tables in the uh, lower size. And the second point is to uh, apply the high efficiency refrigerant tools. After that, we have test and compare the results of the total lifetime of CO2 reduction. Next slide, please. And here's the results. We have test and uh, EVRS and compare the results based on the uh, SAE 2765 standard. In conclusion, the HMAX or high efficiency system can reduce CO2 emission uh, approximately 24.3% or 14.6 gram of CO2 per kilometers. Next slide, please. Next. And we assume that if this high efficiency um, mobile air con has become widespread from 20, uh, 26 with the installation ratio from 5%, so we could reduce the CO2 emission by almost 750,000 ton of CO2 in 2030s. This is the in Thailand case. And next. Next slide, please. Okay. 
this way. If HMAC become widespread all over the ASEAN market, we would be able to save the CO2 emission approximately 4.9 million ton of CO2 or 2.3 billion liter of gasoline in 2030s. Next, please. Next, please. Okay. And this is the next phase of our activities. We have three key challenge points. The first one is we need to set up the standard of high efficiency mobile aircon with the all stakeholders. After that, we need to propose our proposal to the government to attribute the CO2 off cycle credit in the futures. This year, we will attribute the test facility in KMUTT University and expect to start collecting the market data within this fiscal year. Up until now, we have had a very good support from Department of Alternative Energy Development and Efficiency, or uh, DDE, under the Ministry of uh, Energy, especially for the budget allocation. So please give us your continuous support in this future too. Next slide, please. And it's come up to my last slide. And this is the project connection map with our stakeholders. So we will keep continuing our study and promote this project and make it become practical policies and able to uh, contribute to the uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. So please give us your kind collaboration and support. That's all for my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Pradit Mahasaksiri, for your presentation on high efficiency mobile air conditioners. And thank you for all of the presenters for your presentations on the flagship projects of the CEFI under the CEFIA platform. Before we move to our next session on the API phase two and CEFI activities, we will have a short break for uh, five minutes. So right now it is showing uh, 10.42 Jakarta time. I would like to kindly request all of the participants, panelists and speakers to return to this forum at 10.47 uh, Jakarta time. During the meantime, to all, of the, to all of the attendees and participants, if you have any questions regarding the presentations from the presenters, please kindly utilize the question function on your GoToWebinar control panel. You can ask the question directly and it will be answered directly by the presenters. Thank you very much and see you in five minutes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the second Cleaner Energy Future Initiative for ASEAN or CEFIA Forum, second session. In this session, we will discuss about APAIC Phase 2 and CEFIA activities. During session two, it will, it will be guided by our moderator, Mr. Septia Buntara, Manager of REE Department, ASEAN Center for Energy. Mr. Septia is currently managing the Sustainable Energy, Renewable Energy, and Energy Efficiency Department or REE Department of ASEAN Center for Energy. His role includes planning, executing, monitoring, and evaluating the activities and projects under the REE Department and align the activities with the priority of the 10 ASEAN member states. Mr. Septia Buntara, please, the time and floor for the second session is yours. Thanks, Alfred. Good morning from Jakarta, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in this session, I hope you will find an interesting part of Sofia. One of that is, um, what is the connection and contribution from Sofia to the ASEAN Energy Blueprint named the ASEAN Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation? Not only that, you will also find an interesting part of the presentation from our member states to share clean energy policy and initiatives. Ladies and gentlemen, I have lined up speakers here. For the first one, you will hear about 
an overview of energy situation and policy, highlighting opportunities and challenges uh, for achieving energy transition. I would like to call my one of my good friends. She is the lady behind the most of Sophia activity arrangement, an APAIC officer which holds bachelor degree on environmental engineering from ITB of Indonesia and master degree on sustainable energy management, State University of New York, Ms. Dinta Munardi. Time is yours. I will remind you if your time is about to finish, please. Um, thank you. Thank you. I think we still yeah. can't hear your voice. Now it's okay, okay now right? Okay, please. Okay, um, thank you, Sapia, for your kind introductions. Um, I think uh, first I would like to um, take this opportunity first to uh, thank all the participants uh, for joining this forum. And it was uh, an honor for me to start these sessions by introducing you our recently endorsed the ASEAN Plan of Actions for Energy Cooperation Phase 2 for 2021 to 2025. Um, I think um, before I get in, right into it, uh, I think it's important for me to um, introduce you the general ideas of what, what is the ASEAN Plan of Actions for Energy Cooperation itself. So uh, the ASEAN Plan of Actions for Energy Corporations, or what we call it APAC, is actually a series of a guiding policy document that support the implementations of uh, multilateral energy cooperation. And it also serves as a blueprint for the energy corporations that also align with the ASEAN economic community um, goals. And then um, the ASEAN have been implementing the APAC uh, for over two decades ago. It started back in 1998. Um, it was first um, endorsed by the 16 uh, ASEAN Ministers on Energy Meeting, or AMEM. Uh, the first five-year cycles of the APAC is for um, 1999 to, to 2004. And then we have two other five-year period of the APAC. And then started in 2016, um, ASEAN agreed to expand the period of the APAIC from five years to 10 years in order to see more longer uh, perspective and also to have a longer term uh, goals and targets as well. So the current APAIC 2016 to 2025, um, the implementation was divided into two phases. Um, the first phase we have it um, starting in 2016 until last year, we already finalized it. And then also uh, last year during the 38 ASEAN Ministers on Energy Meeting, which was um, hosted by the Ministries of Industry and Trade Vietnam, we endorsed the new APAI Phase 2 for this year until 2025. Um, I think it's also have mentioned uh, by Mr. Chris in the early uh, morning sessions. Um, so the APAI Phase 2 was developed by the APAI Drafting Committee, that committee that uh, consists from the 10 ASEAN member states and also um, the representative from the ASEAN uh, Secretariat and also ASEAN Center for Energy. We conducted several consult consultative meetings in terms of planning the activities, the priorities, and also um, the target that we are going to have uh, within the, the range of the uh, coming five years. And then as a foundation of this APAIC phase two as well, um, we include some of the global perspective that we think that can shape the ASEAN energy landscape, um, which include the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We also look into the dynamics of the fourth industrial revolutions, um, also the trends of energy transitions, economic growth, and then the last, we also include the impact of COVID-19 pandemic to the ASEAN energy sector. And also regarding the theme, we retain the overall uh, 10 years theme of the APAIC 2016 to 2025, which is enhancing energy connectivity and market integrations in ASEAN to achieve energy security, accessibility, affordability, and sustainability. But um, also we come up with the new sub theme for the specific APAIC phase two, which is to accelerate energy transitions and strengthening resilience through greater innovations and cooperations. Um, 
I think for this one also have been mentioned by uh, Mr. Chris, uh, but I, I will um, I will explain later in my next slides. But I think uh, the, the one that really related into the clean energy development is um, our our program areas number four and five, um, which is we come up with more ambitious targets to reduce energy intensity, um, which is to reduce energy intensity by 32%. Um, by 2025 and also expand the areas of energy efficiency and conservation. And we also include the transport and industry sector uh, as a priorities in the appliances too. And then for the renewable energy, we retain our aspirational target to increase the share of RE by uh, 22, 23% in uh, total primary energy supply. And then to also add um, additional indicator, which is to achieve 35% of uh, the share of RE in installed power capacity by 2025. Um, so this, this next slide uh, will show you only the table um, on the activities that we, we will going to conduct for the API phase two. So we have seven program area. Um, it's the same program area that we have in the previous phase of API. Um, and then each program area, they have each um, outcome-based strategies or OBS. And then this OBS, these strategies also reflected into the um, action plan and then also come up uh, in, each, in each action plan, we, we have um, a lineup of the annual milestone each year. Um, here, if you can see in the table for um, throughout the five year, we we actually have almost 250 activities or uh, annual milestones to be conducted. And for 2021 itself, uh, we are, we're going to conduct 76 um, activities or annual milestones um, within the seven program areas. So for, um, I will not really, um, uh, because of the time limitations, I will only talk more about the outcome strategies of each program areas. For the first program areas, which is the ASEAN Power Grid, um, we have four outcome strategies. Um, actually, um, with, uh, within these program areas, we, we're trying to accelerate the ASEAN Power Grid project and also to, um, to accelerate the implementations of the multilateral power trading which also we include the enhancements on the institutional frameworks and regulate, uh, regulations of the entity and also to harmonizing the min minimum uh, technical, requires, uh, technical requirements uh, in terms of implementing the entity. And also we, we include the integrations of our e system into the ASEAN Power Grid as well. For the program area number two, uh, which will be focused on the Trans-ASEAN Gas Pipeline, uh, there are three strategies um, where we would like to enhance the gas and LNG connectivity and also accessibility through the pipeline and gasification terminal. terminal. And we also will promote the uh, common uh, gas market for ASEAN. And then for the program area number three, uh, which is uh, coal and clean coal technology, we have, we have four outcome strategies. For, uh, within these program areas, we would like to um, improve the role of the clean coal technology, including the carbon capture, utilization, and storage, um, and also its role in the low carbon economy. We, we will conduct several activities, uh, varies from capacity buildings, um, public awareness, and also uh, some of the studies that, will like, that we would like to enhance the uh, research and also innovations on the clean coal technology itself. And then um, related to the clean energy development, uh, we have the program area number four, which is the energy efficiency and conservation. Um, we have five outcome-based strategies and also a total 14 action plans. Um, for the first strategies, we will uh, be focusing on the standard and levelings on the energy efficiency. Um, through some of the activities, including the national and nat uh, national and regional policy roadmaps, also strengthening the minimum um, energy performance uh, standards, and also um, the developments of the energy efficiency uh, mutual recognition agreement. 
the for the sec for the second strategies uh, will be focused on the uh, private partnership um, and also financial uh, institutions. We will be and we will be explore more business uh, matchmaking activities and also forum. Um, and I think Sophia would be also bring uh, benefits in this uh, in the specific areas. And then uh, we we also would like to uh, engage with more financial institution and also acknowledge some of the industry that um, already have implemented the energy efficiency effort in the region. And also for the um, strategies number three, uh, it will be focused on the um, energy efficiency in building. We're we will um, have the building and cooling roadmap. And then uh, for the strategies four and five, it will be specific for transport and industry, where the uh, activities will be vary from capacity building and also information sharing. For the um, program area number five, which is renewable energy, we have six outcome-based strategies with a total 16 action plan. The first strategy is we, is we would like to develop a long-term ASEAN renewable energy roadmap that also consider some of the important studies that have been conducted in the ASEAN, including the sixth ASEAN energy outlook, the second renewable energy outlook, and also the, um, the AIMS-3 uh, studies by the, um, by the ASEAN Power Grid uh, program areas. And then um, for the second strategies, we, we would like to uh, see more high level that, uh, policy dialogue uh, to talk more about renewable energy policy, technology, and also to, to basically trigger the in-depth uh, planning and analysis for the for activity specific to renewable energy. And then for um, strategies number three, we will be focusing on the research and development where we will engage with more um, research institutions and also universities. And then for the uh, strategies number four, I uh, will be focused on the financing uh, scheme or of the renewable energy. We will also engage with financial institutions and also to explore the RE finance support mechanisms in ASEAN. And then for the strategies number five, it will be uh, more focused on the bioenergy and biofuel. We will also engage with more bioenergy and biofuel stakeholders, um, including the transport sector, um, uh, tra transport sectoral um, institutions and organizations. And then for the last um, strategies, we, we would like to enhance the role of ACE as the Renewable Energy Information and Training Centers, where we, we will conduct the annual thematic capacity building and also training as well regarding the RE technology. And then for the program area number six, uh, which is renewable energy policy and planning, we have six outcome strategies. Um, for the specific program areas, we, we're trying to engage with more broader uh, dialogue partners and international organizations. We will also um, enhance um, our energy profile, uh, including the enhancements of energy, ASEAN energy database, and also um, energy policy and planning. We also include um, the important strategies, uh, which is uh, the connections on energy and climate um, through the information sharing uh, within this program areas. And then the last program um, areas that we have is civilian nuclear energy, uh, where we are trying to uh, in increase the public awareness and also um, the public literacy in terms of the um, nuclear energy for power generations. And then for uh, my last slide, um, I would like to also inform that as ACE currently is planning the APAIC phase two and also six asset energy outlook dissemination campaign for um, this um, first quarter of 2021. Uh, where we're we're going to um, showcase the applied phase two and also the six ASEAN energy outlook to the public. Um, so the activities will be vary from uh, the internal preparatory uh, activities, and we also will engage with the PR agency um, in terms of helping us in some of activities such as like 
press conference, media interview, and also uh, visual communication tools. And then we will also be having the public webinar um, to disseminate uh, the, as the APIC phase two and six ASEAN energy outlook. And then we will also have two series of workshop uh, on the APIC phase two that related to the energy transitions and energy res uh, resilience. And then um, the other activities, we will also engage with the ASEAN member state uh, through the focus group discussion where we will um, we will align the regional goals in the APAC with um, each uh, ASEAN member state national plans. And then last, we also will, will uh, conduct the partner coordination conference where we will invite some of the relevant dialogue partners um, and international organizations to basically discuss on the potential collaborations um, with ACE and also ASEAN in terms of supporting the implementations of the five phase two. Um, yeah, I think that's conclude my presentations. Um, I think if uh, everyone here would like to know more about ACE uh, latest publication, you can uh, you can just visit our website and also social media. Thank you very much, back to Safia. Perfect timing. Uh, thanks, Tinta, for the presentation. I hope everyone uh, now can see the overall plan of the ASEAN Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation, the phase two, our plan until 2025. The next presentation, I'm sure will also as interesting as the first one. This time I would bring you to see our hosting countries, clean energy development and policies. Anybody know about 4D and 1E policy? So here we go. Uh, you will find the answer by hearing carefully the presentation by Mr. Wacharin Bonyarit, Director of Strategy and Planning Division, Department of Alternative Energy Development and Efficiency, or DEDE, Ministry of Energy, Thailand. Director Wacharin, time is yours. You will have 10 minutes to deliver your presentation, please. Uh, introduction. So, and uh, good morning, everybody. <laughs> So uh, today I would like to present the, the Thailand Clean Energy Development and Policy. As you uh, may know that uh, now Thailand have uh, the challenges in the energy situation and the new policy for us. Next slide, please. So uh, this slide we will show you as a uh, Septia has uh, introduced. introduced that we have now uh, the policy of 4D and 1E. The 4D is come from the, uh, we try to uh, digitalization of the energy system of the country. Uh, for example, we try to introduce the smart grid for the country and energy storage system. The second is uh, how, how to uh, de decentralization of the energy system of the country. As you may know that in the in the in the last uh, decade, we uh, rely on the uh, energy system that uh, come from the the big uh, power plant or big uh, utilization. But in the next future, we try to uh, uh, decentralize the energy system to the smart grid, micro grid, and the com community grid uh, along the country. The, the, the third one is uh, how to decarbonization of the energy system. Uh, as you may know, the, 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 the global trend, we try to reduce the carbon uh, consumption to, to the global. So the energy system of Thailand in the future, we try to reduce the fossil-based uh, uh, electricity uh, uh, distribution uh, uh, replaced by the solar system or the renewable uh, energy more. So uh, the fourth one is uh, the regulation. The, the, the major problem of the country that we try to promote the energy efficiency of renewable energy. Uh, someone is the, the, the regulation barrier uh, for the law and uh, some regulation that is the barrier to promote the renewable in the country. So in the future, we try to reduce all uh, the regulation, uh, many, many regulations in the country to promote more uh, renewable energy. 
So the last one is to uh, the 1E. 1E is come from the electrification of the, the system. So uh, uh, in the next future, we uh, will see more uh, electric vehicle in the country or a more energy storage. So uh, like a, a transportation system, we will go to the EV in the uh, future. Next slide, please. This is uh, uh, the uh, Thailand integrated blueprint that we have the major plan of the five plan in the country. Uh, the first one is a power development plan that will be have a major revision in the in the near future. And energy efficiency plan, uh, 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 alternative energy plan, and gas plan and oil plan. Next, please. This is the sharing uh, to show you that uh, the energy consumption for the Thailand, you will see that the most two uh, sectors that consume a lot of uh, energy in the country is come from the transportation and industrial uh, sector. Uh, the two, the do, those two sectors consume over 70% uh, of the total consumption in the country. Next, please. Next, please. So, uh, for the renewable energy, I would like to show you that Thailand have a target to promote the renewable energy in the country. Uh, by the year of 2037, we target uh, the uh, capacity uh, installation of renewable energy. Uh, to be the 30% of the total installation of the uh, energy system of the country. But right now we have achieved around 16% uh, of the renewable energy for the country. Next, please. This is show you the, the present situation that uh, the 16 sharing of the renewable energy in Thailand come from many, many uh, renewable stocks, such as the solar system, wind, small hydropower, biomass, biogas, and also the biofuel like uh, ethanol and biodiesel. Next, please. This is how to show you that the principal activity under the uh, AEDP 2018 as you may know that the last year we have a, a minor revision of the AEDP of the Thailand plan. Uh, we have some uh, change uh, for the uh, activity under the renewable, renewable energy in the country. The last year uh, we try to more promote the uh, EV use in the country. Uh, in the same time, we try to promote more technology about the energy storage to uh, support the new renewable source like a solar energy. So this is a, a, a big turn of the Thailand uh, that we uh, will promote more solar in the future. But in the same time, for the uh, biofuel policy, we still to promote the biodiesel and ethanol, but we try to uh, develop more a uh, standard like a Euro 5 in the country also in the future. Next, please. Uh, the way forward for the renewable energy development for the, the Thailand uh, that uh, you may know that we have the uh, big five plan uh, from uh, PDP, AEDP, EEP, oil, oil and gas plan. But uh, right now, uh, Thailand minister have to uh, focusing in the future that we have uh, to develop more challenge plan and policy for the country. That means uh, Thailand will try to promote more uh, renewable or clean energy more than uh, the last decade and uh, uh, more, more aggressive and aggressive in the future. 
that means that we try to promote a lot uh, of uh, renewable in the country and at the same time we try to promote energy efficiency too so uh, last year we have some uh, new uh, scheme for the solar we, we call it the public solar scheme we uh, increase the uh, power purchasing rate uh, from the solar uh, solar panel in the uh, solar installation in the country. Uh, we uh, increase the the rate, the price of the buying rate uh, around 30% as the last year. This is a uh, tend to uh, the people that they view um, uh, interesting more to invest the solar energy in the country. Next, please. Next, I would like to uh, talk about the energy efficiency plan in the country. Thailand has the Energy Conservation Act that uh, try to promote and regulate the uh, energy consumer, the big consumer in the country. Uh, as you know that uh, transportation and industry is the biggest consumer, consumer in the country. So for the uh, for the industry and the big building in the country we have uh, to regulate them to follow the energy efficiency scheme uh, led by the ministry of energy next please this is a target of the energy efficiency plan or eep in the thailand uh, in the uh, 2037 we try to reduce the energy intensity uh, by 30%. That means uh, the energy efficiency uh, to use the energy of the country will be uh, better uh, more than uh, the current situation is the next 20 years. Next, please. This is show you the, uh, the target of the EEP in Thailand you will see that we have target of energy reduction by the electric city uh, uh, sector around 31 uh, percent and uh, uh, energy reduction in the thermal system around 69 uh, percent the the major target uh, is come from the industrial around 43 percent and followed by the transportation sector Next, please. This is the scheme that we uh, use to promote energy efficiency of the country. You will see that we have three parts. Uh, firstly, as a compulsory measure, uh, compulsory measure from the uh, energy management standard uh, to the industry and building in the country. The voluntary scheme is come from the uh, to promote the equipment standard and leveling. And we have some uh, grant or final financial support that come from the Energy Conservation Fund uh, to promote uh, the investment uh, of the high efficiency equipment or machine. The last one is a complementary measure. This come from the uh, development of the human resource and development of the uh, to the public uh, awareness and uh, to uh, public uh, and the research and development to the technology in the country. Next, please. This is uh, the criteria or classification of the designated factory and buildings. Uh, the big building that consume or installation uh, more than one megawatt of electricity have to be uh, regulated uh, as the designate, designate uh, factory and buildings. They have to follow the standard of the uh, energy uh, efficiency and they have to, uh, uh, to designate to uh, the person like an energy manager to control the use and to do the energy efficiency measure in the factory or buildings. Next, please. 
Next, please. Yeah, this is uh, another um, uh, another scheme for the building. Uh, this is called the building energy code. Uh, as you know that we have energy management for the uh, the existing existing building, but for the new building or the major retrofit building, they have to follow the new criteria from the government. We call this uh, building energy code. Uh, before the uh, instruct, uh, instruction of the building, they have to uh, to 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 submit the blueprint of the, uh, the construction, and the Ministry of Energy have to prove that the building will be to be uh, will be uh, uh, the building as uh, to be efficiency building uh, uh, through the criteria that we have set up. Next, please. This is a timeline that we uh, plan to regulate the new uh, uh, building energy code. Firstly, we uh, try to uh, all be regulate first for the building uh, that uh, have a total area more than 10,000 square meter. And the next year we will expand to the smaller and smaller building. Next, please. Well, just to interrupt, uh, Dr. Wancharin, you will uh, have one more minute, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is uh, uh, the criteria to be um, uh, discussed or to be uh, certified by Building Energy Code. Uh, you will see that Building Energy Code should be uh, uh, developed, the building develop lighting system and connection system, for example. Next, please. This is a scheme of the high high energy efficiency product or equipment that uh, we call the energy leveling. Next, please. Next, please. Then the last one. I will show you the the important scheme in the Thailand. We have um, the uh, the subsidy or the financing mechanism. Uh, they, we have revolving fund with the soft loan for the. Uh, um, building of a uh, factory to invest the high efficiency technology or product in the uh, factory. And next, please. We have another scheme with uh, the program called, is well known uh, uh, program in Thailand, we call 80, 20. Uh, the government will keep the, the investment uh, to be 20% or 30% for the cost that where they invest the high efficiency, high efficiency product in the in the uh, factory, for example. This is all my presentation that uh, we show you that Thailand have a challenge target for the clean energy, uh, both in the renewable energy and energy efficiency. So the next future we try to more aggressive and more uh, target. Uh, that now we are working to do that in the future. That is my presentation. Thank you. Well, I think uh, everybody agree that's super informative uh, presentation coming from uh, Director Wacharin. Thank you very much, Director Wacharin. Um, digitalization uh, and decentralization, decarbonization, the regulation as well as the electrification is the yeah, indispensable uh, elements of pursuing renewable energy and energy efficiency um, to support cleaner energy initiative in Thailand. I think that could be a very good um, example to scale up uh, later in the in the region. That is very interesting point. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wacharin. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a tour. Uh, from Thailand, we move to Brunei Darussalam. Um, as the chairman of uh, ASEAN Energy Meeting in 2021, let's hear uh, how is, uh, the country define clean energy perspective, including its initiative and policies. This presentation will be delivered by Mr. Chef Muhammad Faiz bin Sheikh uh, Haji Fadila, the Special Duties Officer from the Sustainable Energy Division, Ministry of Energy. Mr. Faiz, time is yours, please. You have 10 minutes of presentation. Uh, 
thank you very much, Ms. Uh, I would like to begin by saying the Bible Salam's origin analogy in the context of the world known in Thailand by its village. And it is access and sustainability. You want to fly, please? Um, Mr. Faiz, apologize to interrupt. Uh, may I give you maybe uh, 30 seconds to um, uh, adjust your uh, device microphone? Because from uh, my side, at least, uh, couldn't hear your voice clearly because of the noise, please. Please. Okay, well, yes. Would you mind to try it now again? Oh, okay. Please, please continue, Mr. Vice. Apologize for interrupting your time. Please. We have achieved ninety-nine percent of world connected energy access. We have in fact small developing projects which are for communities in remote areas to support rural electrification. However, in the long term, these outbreak areas will be connected to the main grid. So, this is in line with our aspirations and our national energy policy with the sustainable development goals. And the sustainable development goals are ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. In terms of energy security, currently, our fuel looks for power generation, mainly fossil fuel by power generation. In the future, however, we will be further diversifying our interest with the infusion of renewable energy technologies for our power generation. From our perspective, we play our part in supporting the region's. For the East Asia and Asia Pacific region, we can see that gas will continue. As a matter of export of gas, we need to continue protecting the region with this very important resource, plus also to explore further, exposure, further opportunities for the energy transition. In regards of start to sustain, we just launched the National Climate Change Policy in 2020, which includes strategies funding the energy transition and low carbon development. Topics such as industrial energy and power management. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So, we see ample opportunities for our natural gas in this energy transition from a domestic perspective. Uh, we see, uh, we need to reduce our uh, emissions of gas in power and industrial applications. This is in line with our ambitions and the climate climate policy. Also looking to improve efficiency of power plants with the modernization of our existing and greater power management in both supply and demand sides. This will allow for better use of our gas resources. Let's go power to Support our downstream growth. This will gas legend for future upstream activities. In the more global or international perspective, we perceive that there will be new market dynamics post 2022. On the other hand, we are also very interested in new emerging technologies such as energy for gas, whereas hydrogen, leverage, and the in the Salam is integrating into the global value chain of hydrogen. We are keen on supporting the interested countries of the transition to build the hydrogen economy. Next slide, please. On 
Hello, uh, Mr. Pais, apologies to interrupt you again. Would you mind to a bit closer with your microphone, please? Okay. Because uh, uh, your voice is a bit breaking. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to share some information okay, on the number of, I would like to share some information on the number of activities focusing, focusing on our renewable district, which is related to green energy that we carried out last year. Uh, as some you know, the renewable district is known as the Green Job of Brunei. Projects and initiatives include green buildings such as energy audits and green building lights, as well as the replacement of steam lighting to solar power lighting. Uh, in regards to uh, clean energy supply, they are enhancing the power grid to the main uh, to, from the main line to reduce science on our diesel power generation to Mulong. Next slide, please. In regards to our green building uh, initiative in Tumuro, uh, we will carry out some energy audit activities. Uh, so our first phase focus on government buildings and second phase focus on commercial buildings. Uh, from this, we will come up with recommendations on energy efficiency index for Tumuro district. Uh, this essentially will provide a guide for future investment and development in the Tumuro district, ensuring that it remains uh, low carbon. Next slide, please. Under the energy transition framework, we have uh, identified a number of possibilities in technology, digitalization, as well as a different status quo from a great operational perspective due to increase renewable share and further integrated energy system. So, uh, among these, identify that decentralized energy back to our policy, uh, whereby a generation will come from small-scale systems scattered around the grid. In regards to our net metering, currently we are running a pilot project which started uh, Q4 last year. Green hydrogen from new renewables is also an area of interest, uh, as in and potentially exporting energy in different form. CCUS is also vital in our role of the energy sector. Energy storage as well, could be in the form of batteries, hydrogen, EVs, or other technology, or material waiting to be developed as accommodated for our future increase in share of renewables in the energy sector. Uh, in addition to this, digitalization will empower us with a fully integrated system to collect, process, monitor, and bring upon further improvements to the system. Uh, standard systems will be operating and providing the required for balancing supply and demand reliably. Next slide, please. Uh, once I would like to thank you very much for this opportunity. In this 
I have highlighted areas of particular interest for the United Asylum, such as uh, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, renewable energy, energy storage, renewable energy policy. Depending, I would just like to mention that we are keen to collaborate with our partners uh, on sites and projects to our ASEAN future this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Faiz, uh, for sharing the Clean Energy Initiative in Brunei Darussalam. I think your um, highlight on energy storage and reverse auction bidding is one of the prominent part in enhancing renewables in the country. And yes, um, digitalization is also the vital part for both energy efficiency and renewable energy sector. Thanks for that. And also we take note on the initiative of Brunei Darussalam to enhance cooperation with partners on renewable energy and energy efficiency. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as one of the biggest economy, uh, ASEAN needs strong support from the other country. Um, SEFIA uh, is one of an evidence how we care about partnership to pursue energy transition. Our goal uh, uh, is to uh, make a connection and to support each other to achieve the regional and also national target. For the next presenter, our good friend from MRI of Japan will, um, uh, will elaborate uh, more about alignment between SEFIA and APEC phase two. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is Ms. Shinchi Kikuko, Senior Researcher, Climate Change Solutions Group Sustainability Division of MRI, she has 13 years of experience working on carbon credit creation project, climate finance studies, and supporting low carbon and adoption of business development in ASEAN countries. She holds BA in anthropology with specialization in urban studies, University of California, Los Angeles. Ms. Sinchi, time is yours, please. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Ms. Septia. Um, good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As a member of the Secretariat team of CEFIA since its inception last year, I'm very honored to speak at this session today. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the idea of developing CEFIA collaboration roadmap for contribution to APA Ed Phase 2. Next slide, please. I will first briefly uh, review the concept of APAIC Phase 2 and CEFIA to highlight the common ground and identify specific areas they can collaborate. Um, secondly, I would like to share with you what we expect to achieve through developing a CEFIA collaboration roadmap. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as already explained in detail uh, by Ms. Dinta of ACE, the objective of APAEC is to promote um, energy transition, resilience, and growth uh, through various means, including utilization of advanced technologies and facilitating private sector involvement in addressing climate change. And CEFIA is a good match addressing these goals. As you can see, the objective of CEFIA is to propel development of environments in which businesses lead businesses business-led dissemination of low carbon technologies through promotion of technology itself, institutional arrangements, and promotion of finance, which have direct overlap with direct directions of APAEC, while institutional or policy framework is an essential driver in de delivering such technologies and finance. Next slide, please. CEFIA can contribute to APAEC through actions and functions. CEFIA can directly contribute to specific program areas through specific actions, such as the flagship projects. For example, flagship projects such as zero energy building and rain care control, as um, already introduced in session one, they can directly contribute to the goals in energy efficiency and conservation program area while the proposed finance flagship can contribute to all areas and especially the program area number six, the regional energy policy and planning. Also, CEFIA can contribute to priority concepts through functions. For example, CEFIA's function as a catalyst 
can facilitate investment and finance through bridging stakeholders and visualizing climate impact. Cepheus functions as a data bank through Cepheus Digital Platform, which has just been pre-launched, um, can have a direct link with Upwipe database system in the future. Also, Cepheus function as a showcase, such as the forum of today, can facilitate knowledge sharing. Next slide, please. Now I would like to move on to the introduction of the idea of Cephia Collaboration Roadmap. Next slide, please. In order to clarify actions and timeline for collaboration, we would like to propose developing a roadmap of Cephia Collaboration, as we believe through roadmap, we can specify actions that will bring results through collaboration among the various stakeholders. Next slide, please. Now I would like to share with you um, our idea note for Cephia Collaboration Roadmap. The first section of the idea note will cover what Cephia Collaboration with APAEC will bring. The roadmap will lay out measures that lead to creation of new business opportunities through innovation, demonstration of not only the technology, but business model itself, finance mobilization, sharing of best practice and capacity building, and last but not least, the importance of visualizing the impact of actions such as the renewable energy ratio or energy efficiency performance and GHG emissions reduction. What I would like to emphasize here is that CEFIA will contribute to APAEC goals by providing government business platform and aim to deliver not just one project model, but a business diffusion model facilitate by, facilitated by policy for cleaner energy business acceleration and mobilization of finance. Next slide, please. Cepheus missions and com key components are highly relevant to APAEC. This may be a repetition of many of you uh, who have participated in previous sessions and presentation, but allow me to stress that Cepheus function as expressed in the mission um, portion of this slide and key, co key components as expressed in the lower right hand portion of this slide. Again, the low carbon technology, finance, and institutional development, which are key components of CEFIA, are very much the essence covered in priority areas of APEC phase two. And the functions as mentioned in the mission portion can have direct impact on delivering results. Next slide, please. Second section of the idea note is about the role of a roadmap in CEFIA collaboration with APEC. First of all, it's very important to translate CEFIA mission into action plans, and roadmap will do that. Secondly, a roadmap can set key concepts through prioritizing on focus areas, proposing specific schemes that would result in facilitation of key energy policy and collaborative activities to achieve the APAEC targets. Thirdly, a roadmap can clarify role, the role of CEFIA in achieving specific, specific goals and proposing actions in stages. Next slide, please. The third section will introduce the actual roadmap. We expect the roadmap will cover three themes. One for visualization of climate change impact with the collaboration with Regional Energy Policy and Planning Area, which is the program area six of APAEC. The second theme is on finance, with link with, the, uh, with also the program area number six, the Regional Energy Policy and Planning, but also with linkage with energy efficiency and the renewable energy areas. And the third theme would be the flagship projects. Depending on the topic, it can collaborate with either the ASEAN Power Grid, Energy and Energy Efficiency and Conservation Area, and also other areas as shown on this slide. Next slide, please. 
as for the timeline, uh, we have in mind to finalize the roadmap by, by the third CEFIA forum later this year. After this forum, we want to set up a task force where we can discuss specific issues and ideas of actions, and with the aim of submitting a draft to the senior officials meetings on energy, uh, which is going to be held in June, and to ASEAN Minister of Energy meetings, which is going to be held in September this year. A roadmap implementation will be carried out in two stages, in short terms, uh, divided into short terms and mid-term goals, and with review process at, each of, at the end of each stage. Next slide, please. Um, I would like to elaborate uh, a little bit more on the idea of a roadmap development, uh, especially for the visual visualization of climate change impact. Step one uh, refers to the, uh, this meeting today and immediately after. Uh, we would like to hear, first hear um, all the stakeholders' needs and views. Step two is the discussion through the task force, as I, mentioned, as I just mentioned in my previous slide. We would like to discuss basic concept of the visualization and possible actions resulting in a draft roadmap. Step three is the refinement of the collaboration schemes with APAEC2, and step four is launching it at the third CEPIA forum. Next slide, please. So um, as I have kept on uh, repeating the word visualization, and some of you may be wondering what that exactly means. Um, it, is, uh, it, is re it refers to accounting of climate mitigation impact, which is basically the quantification of the greenhouse gas emission reductions as the result of activities uh, conducted in CEFIA. And we believe that it enhances activities planned in APAEC2, especially since, as, as mentioned in the outcome-based outcome strategy of program area number six, um, it di directly links with energy climate nexus. And I believe that uh, visualizing climate change impact will also um, have a positive impact and attractive in attracting investment and finance. To this end, we believe that visualizing climate change impact um, not only for individual projects, but also for diffusion model is crucial in, in aiding uh, business growth. Next slide, please. For staged actions, we propose to focus, we propose to focus on technical discussions and concept discussions in the short term and carry out pilot activities and assessment in the midterm. Next slide, please. And now I would like to um, share some idea for the implementation scheme um, of the visualization uh, concept. The first step of visualization is already actually being carried out based on CEPIA actions, such as the feasibility study, demonstration, or policy recommendation, or flagship projects. This will be carried out in collaboration with industry and academic partners who are participating in these activities. The second step is the actual quantification of emissions reduction, which will be done by CEFIA stakeholders and eventually will be assessed for contribution to APA Act 2 Next slide, please. Last but not least, I want to introduce you to the pre-launch of the CEFIA digital platform. This website is not just about ready, is just about ready to enhance CEFIA roles through digital collaboration. Initially, it will um, serve mainly as a digital, um, digital archives. Um, and uh, I, I'm assuming that all the uh, materials uh, shared with you today at this forum will be available on this website also. And eventually, we hope to make it an interactive platform where we can um, exchange views and ideas um, and information online. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sinchi, for the great presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, now time uh, for us for the most uh, exciting part of our session today uh, on this uh, session two. Uh, we have um, a discussion sharing uh, session. Uh, we got so much information related with the APIC phase two, also related with the national target as well as our partner's perspective for CEFIA. Uh, I would like to invite all of the speakers to join me to the stage to open your camera, please. Would like to start with Ms. Dinta. Also, uh, Mr. Wacharin, Mr. Faiz, as well as Ms. Sinchi. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, first, uh, I would like to go to Director Wacharin and Mr. Faiz. Um, you presented well about Thailand and Brunei's policy and initiative. Um, based on your perspective, and of course, based on the priority areas, and we, uh, when we link with APIC, uh, which presented earlier, what Thailand and Brunei expect to gain uh, from the CEFIA for the current cooperation that we have under CEFIA. I would like to go to Dr. Uh, Director Wacharin first. You have two minutes uh, to share your perspective, please. Yes, please. Um, I think that um, uh, the expectation from Thailand, I think that uh, CEFIA can 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 conduct us or can uh, assistance uh, have some assistance about the. Uh, uh, Technology profile that that uh, we can uh, achieve the the reduction of the energy and to uh, to to reduce uh, uh, the pollution of climate change in the country. I think that um, now in Thailand we try to develop um, more and more technology in the in those area, but uh, in some technology such as the Internet of Things all the uh, technology that uh, have uh, advanced technology so uh, we try to introduce those technology in the country um, uh, the, the the second way we try to uh, to go to the people awareness in the country to promote the, how they use uh, energy more efficient or uh, to use the uh, renewable energy more more renewable energy that is the, the expect, expectation that, that Thailand uh, would like to, to have from CPM. Fully noted, Director Wacharin, on the new technology as well as the connection with the people awareness. That's a very good point. Thank you very much. Uh, may I go to Mr. Faiz, please? You have two minutes to share. Uh, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Exactly. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I think from the Brunei perspective, uh, I would just like to share that uh, we could use a lot of technical advanced counterparts as well as uh, our partners to be uh, maybe in any uh, other project and in the term uh, for me on the investment as well. Uh, I can just say that since we're still in our beginnings, of uh, our RE policy and development in country, uh, I think it would be uh, very much useful for uh, our side uh, to have this. Uh, for example, uh, from the energy perspective, uh, we have uh, very new, very different market dynamics. Uh, with, uh, with the reduction uh, proposals and the uh, in also like the uh, all purchase agreements, that sort of thing. Uh, I think for the line, this uh, new sort of opportunities and these power purchase agreements, that sort of thing, uh, we could use uh, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, cooperation is the important point um, to reduce the learning curve maybe in terms of the learning uh, process as well as uh, experience for the country especially at the very beginning stage of development well noted mr Faiz, on that 
Um, because it's very interesting uh, to discuss about countries' perspective, may I come back again uh, to Director Wachter and Mr. Faiz on uh, my second question on how energy climate nexus is viewed in member countries and how they are reflecting in existing policies and action. Of course, we hear a lot about, about the EE and renewable energy policy from you. Maybe you can stress out the maybe uh, some important elements or highlighted points that we can maybe later we can see together and improve together the cooperation uh, with the selected country, especially Thailand and Brunei Darussalam. Please, I would like to start with Director Wacharin first. You have 2.5 minutes to share a perspective, please. Yes, uh, for the um, uh, for the climate change uh, situation in Thailand, uh, we now have uh, faced with many, many problems. Uh, firstly, uh, as you know that we consume more and more energy every year, so it uh, more release all the carbon dioxide to the uh, to the uh, to the air in the country. Uh, Besides that, we have faced uh, another problem, just like the air pollution, like a PM 2.5, that is caused the um, uh, policy matter in the country uh, have to uh, thinking how to solve those problems. Uh, and uh, beside that, the people in the country, they have to spend uh, more and more money for the energy um, supply, like uh, in the uh, home appliance or the car, uh, the personal car or the truck. Uh, so uh, those uh, huge consumption uh, also cause the huge um, uh, climate impact in the country. So this is cause uh, for the government, Thai government to to, to think how to uh, rebuild the, the, the new future on the uses of the energy in the country. So that's cause uh, we try to go to reduce the fossil fuels and uh, to promote more renewable energy and to, re uh, to promote the energy efficiency more. And we have the ambitious target in the future that we try to reduce um, uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, CO2 emission and uh, try to promote more and more renewable energy. Uh, we uh, wish that in the future, maybe we can go to uh, near the carbon neutral in the, in the region as uh, uh, we expect that, that we try to go to that. Thank you. So that kind of transitional move from Thailand to increase time to time, not only increasing the target, but also review and evaluate uh, the existing condition in the country. Thank you, Director Wacharin. How about uh, Mr. Faiz, please? Would you like to share your perspective on the earlier question, please? Okay, uh, I apologize to interrupt, uh, Mr. Faiz. Uh, would you mind to move closer to your microphone? Yeah. I'm not sure I can hear your voice clearly. Thank you. Ah, yes, I can hear you now. Please continue. Yeah, I, 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 uh, for us, it's important to balance between our, uh, our main goals of economic growth with our goals of uh, gene development as well. We have our climate, uh, national climate policy uh, indicating uh, the direction we want to go to. Uh, we have export of energy challenges, but also opportunities for us. Uh, I think uh, generally there's a mix of both uh, policy measures and to enable us to achieve our goals. Again, um, we rely heavily on our, for us, uh, it will be the partnership with our organizations, uh, our external parties, and such. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, the carbonization pathway is one of the effort that need to be enhanced time to time in Brunei Jerusalem considering the current potential, also the improvement uh, from Brunei Darussalam. Very not, well noted, uh, Mr. Faiz, for your uh, answer on that. I think that's very interesting as well. 
And I would like to go to uh, Miss Sinchi on this uh, part. We hear a lot from you, um, connection with Sophia, and your opinion and perspective. Uh, what is uh, the benefits and good practice of visualizing climate impacts, especially when the, we connect with the grid planning and uh, action from Japan for the decarbonization path? I think, would you mind to share with us, please? Please, Ms. Shinji. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Septia, for your question. Um, as I already said, um, I think, and I think many people are already aware, um, more and more financial institutions are asking for um, accounting of CO2 emissions uh, when they make their investment or financial decisions. And I think that's a very important uh, trend, um, not just um, in, uh, in Japan, but also in um, ASEAN countries as well. Uh, because when you look at the um, private sector involvement, um, especially um, the most of the private sectors are um, operating on a global basis. And um, some of the experience uh, we've had uh, with this aspect, um, there have been some good examples. Uh, for one, uh, there was a project on uh, introduction of high uh, energy efficiency um, air conditioners in Vietnam, for example. Um, the government of Japan uh, supported in introducing some high um, energy efficiency air conditioners. And um, uh, the project involved um, accounting of emissions reduction. Um, and based on the, um, the reduction uh, uh, results, uh, there was some um, financial support uh, based on that. And also, um, the, uh, together with technology introduction and financial support, uh, there were also um, a lot of um, collaborative work on uh, regulatory and policy uh, framework development. For example, um, the, some testing procedures and evaluation methods and um, standards were um, introduced to um, accurately evaluate um, the climate change impact of the energy efficiency um, air conditioners. So um, com with combination of all the measures, um, the the market penetration rate of the high energy uh, efficiency inverter air conditioners in Vietnam uh, went up from 12% um, in 2009 to about 67% in 2018, which is a really big jump. And I think this sort of action can, uh, repli can be replicated. Um, and so this is uh, one example um, that I can share with you. Thank you. I couldn't agree more on that, uh, Ms. Sinchi. Technology part is very um, crucial for us to consider. However, a lot of challenge there. If we see and hear from the presentation earlier and discussion earlier, especially on the financial support. But of course, we need a more and more partnership uh, on this particular issue. And we hope that can be addressed through the CEFIA arrangement in the future. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to go to um, Ms. Dinta on uh, your perspective on how to enhance the climate initiative within the energy context in the future, especially when we mention a lot of uh, outcome-based strategies under the APEC phase two that we need to carry on for 2025. Please, Ms. Dinta. Um, yes, um, thank you very much for the question, Sepia. I think um, how to enhance the climate initiative in the energy sector um, in terms of the energy sector, I think all the priorities and our activities with the APAC that aim to move forward for uh, transition to more uh, to carbon uh, from carbon intensive energy system to cleaner and lower carbon energy system is really contribute a lot in in the climate in the global climate agenda. But I think other than that, um, since I think since addressing the climate change issues really require a collaborations from many sectors, um, it is essential also for, um, I think, the energy sectors or every practitioners in the energy sector to be more engaged with other sectors such as environment, um, transport, um, and also others, uh, and, and also to enhance the uh, multi collaborations, uh, sec uh, sectoral collaborations. And I think that's also uh, something that we're planning within the APAIC phase two. 
where we will include um, more cross-sectoral um, issues on our activities and priorities. Yeah, I think that's issues. Thank you, Ms. Dinta. So when we talk about coal, we also need to talk about how is the uh, contribution with other sector, right? So we can find the holistic solution letter in the energy sector, as mentioned, it might also contribution from different sectoral areas. So we really need a historic, uh, holistic point of view on these matters. Thank you, Ms. Dinta. Since I I really keen to, to hear also from other uh, speaker about uh, this question, would you mind to share your perspective, maybe one minute on how to enhance the climate initiative within the energy context in the future? Maybe I would like to start uh, with Director Wacharin first. Please. Yeah, thank you, Septia. So, uh, from my uh, perspective, I think that uh, if we uh, if we try to develop the new technology to serve the energy or the clean energy in the future, I think that they will create a more opportunity opportunity for the country. Like that, uh, for example, we can get a new technology for the country. We can get a new job. We can get a new career for the people in the country. And finally, we can uh, promote uh, uh, for the carbon footprint for the country to reduce the air pollution and uh, increase the economic growth at the another way on another dream uh, for the industry sector. So this is, I think that this is a benefit, uh, the overall benefit uh, how to promote the green energy in the country. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Wacharin. So focus on the benefit, mutual benefit between people and environment. I think that's a very good uh, point. Uh, may I go to Mr. Feist, please? Uh, so uh, I believe that the coordination with uh, other stakeholders, be it from the government, the NGOs, and the private sector, is very important. Um, after we from our climate change uh, policy, which is administered by our Brunei Climate Change Secretariat, this of time in the last organizing workshops across the 10 strategies. So, Get everyone involved and aligned in a whole of nation approach. Um, in addition to this enhancing further, I think compliance national standards will help us give access to certain schemes. Uh, for example, uh, um, with the science. I think we need to build our capacity to be able to do that by taking these thank you mr Feis. so the initiative is there for the climate nexus initiative for the future but now maybe a lot of matters that we need to be considered including the capacity building as you mentioned noted thank you very much may i go to uh miss sinchi please uh on this question uh yes i think um i cannot be repeat myself um, uh, more and more, but uh, I think visualization is the key. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's quite um, easy to imagine how renewable energy can con contribute to um, reduction of GHGs. But for some technologies, um, some technologies, it's, it's more difficult. Uh, for example, some component technologies involved in um, uh, factories or um, uh, especially in the IoT area, uh, some sensor technologies, for example, it's not that easy uh, to um, for people to know how such technologies can contribute to um, energy efficiency or carbon emissions reductions. So I think the um, you know developing methodologies to um, visualize um, such Im Im impact for such technology is also important, and I think. Um, I think the director Watchering mentioned that uh, public awareness uh, is also important, and I, I cannot um, agree with him uh, more. I think uh, so. It's not just um, visualizing is not just the answer. You know, after you visualize the impact, you need to share it, and you need um, to make sure that people understand it. So I think um, visualization and public awareness are the uh, very key important uh, factors in um, going further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I also agree on that. Uh, the most important one is the end game. Why we need the public awareness? Why we need the visualization? So 
I think that's also a very important part that we need to consider for the future uh, development, especially related with the climate uh, nexus initiative. Um, I wonder we have much time left, uh, so allow me to just conclude uh, the discussion. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, from the presentation and discussion points, I think uh, we could conclude that uh, the SEFIA initiative bring very positive impact to our clean energy initiative uh, and support for ASEAN and specifically to, uh, to help us in, uh, in APAIC phase two. As mentioned earlier by Ms. Dinta, APAIC uh, phase two aims uh, to enhance energy connectivity and market integration in ASEAN to achieve energy security, accessibility, affordability, and sustainability for all. And talking about the market integration, we heard clearly from Ms. Sinchi that SEFIA is one of two to achieve APAIC goals that lead us for creation of new business opportunities. When we see from the angle of policy and vision, two good examples are shared by Mr. Wacharin, also Mr. Faiz. The countries uh, intensify efforts and initiative on renewable energy and energy efficiency utilization, including through financial support mechanism. This, of course, I hope could bring more positive environment to maximize our renewables potential and at the same time to reduce our energy intensity for a better energy security for the future. In short, strong partnership uh, from the plus three countries, such as from SEFIA, will support ASEAN in achieving the regional and national target. Uh, I hope uh, all of us can join me to thank uh, Japan as the coordinator and initiator of SEFIA for making this uh, opportunity. A lot of things uh, ASEAN need to achieve by 2025. One of these is to achieve the 23% of RE target in TPS by 2025. I think a lot of challenge there. However, by considering all aspects, including business opportunity, it will bring more value and motivation, of course, for us to surpass the target. Lastly, I would like to thanks and congratulate all of my excellent speakers here, Ms. Dinta, Mr. Wacharin, Mr. Faiz, and Ms. Sinchi, and apologize for the limited time. If any audience has inquiries, please feel free to use the chat function or you can contact me through septia at asianenergy.org. Again, I'm Septia from the ASEAN Center for Energy. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will pass the time to our MC, Mr. Alfred, please. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Mr. Septia, for your excellent moderation. Uh, thank you very much to all of our speakers in the second session today. We will now have a one hour lunch break. Currently it is showing 12 p.m. on Jakarta time. And please kindly return to the forum on 1.15 or five minutes before we start our third session. I would like to wish you all to have a, a wonderful lunch and see you again in one hour. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the second SEFIA Forum. I hope you had a wonderful lunch. Now, we would like to move to the next and last session for today's forum. The session will focus on finance for decarbonization pathways, which is a very important topic to talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, to open this session, we will see a memorable signing event between the Asian Development Bank, or ADB, and Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, or METI, Japan, for the Memorandum of Cooperation relating to SEFIA. The signing of the MOC between ADB and METI will be a good stepping stone for enriching the activities of SEFIA. Their cooperation will provide useful inputs to SEFIA, including, but not limited to, data analysis and advices on flagship projects. Given possible positive impacts of their MOC on the wide range of activities under SEFIA, it is very sensible to introduce the signing at this forum so everybody in the SEFIA community will know about the MOC. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to introduce two distinguished representatives from ADB and METI for the MOC signing. On the ADB side, 
we have Dr. Bambang Susantono, Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development. On METI, we have Mr. Tanaka Shigehiro, Vice Minister for International Affairs. First, I would like to invite Vice President Dr. Susantono from ADB to sign the MOC and make comments on the importance of the MOC for Sevilla. Dr. Susantono, you have the floor. Thank you. So let me sign it first. I believe this is the sequence. Then uh, thank you very much again for the opportunity to speak. Vice Minister Tanaka, honorables, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure attending the second forum of the Cleaner Energy Future Initiative for ASEAN, or CEFIA, hosted by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, or METI of Japan, and the Government of Thailand. On behalf of the Asian Development Bank, I'm honored to speak briefly here today as we sign our Memorandum of Cooperation with METI. ADB energy sector lending is about $4 billion a year. While it may sound a lot, it is only a fraction of our developing members' need in the energy sector. Especially in light of the pandemic's global impact today, we must strengthen our partnership with development partners, the private sector, and commercial financing to help fill the large financing gap and upscale the development impact of our support. It is in this context that today's signing of Memorandum of Cooperation shows its value. Since ADB inceptions, Japan has been and remains a very important partner. We particularly appreciate METI's critical support as we strengthen our collective drive toward clean energy in the developing economies of Asia and the Pacific. Through this memorandum, we will further strengthen our cooperation and commitment to help accelerate the ongoing energy transitions and climate actions within the ASEAN region. The memorandum of cooperation between ADB and METI will focus on three areas. First, renewable energy. Second, energy conservation and energy efficiency. And third, other technologies that contribute to the transitions to low carbon energy. Specifically, ADB and METI will support SAFIA by sharing good practices, providing innovative solutions, and implementing joint renewable energy projects and related activities. The joint activities could be feasibility studies, demonstration projects, and training capacity building. Honorables, ladies and gentlemen, ADB's 2009 energy policy has been instrumental in supporting our developing members' energy sector over the last decade. But 12 years on, it is now high time it is revised and updated. The new policy to be rolled out this year will be better aligned with new trends in the energy sector, as well as with the evolving and pressing national and global agendas. We are currently consulting with our stakeholders to ensure that our energy policy remains forward-looking in advancing the sector development in line with the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Equipped with these new directions through the updated policy, ADB looks forward to continuing our contributions to the vision of CEFIA and collaborating closely with METI and the ASEAN member states. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Susantono, for your kind words. Next, I would like to invite Vice Minister Tanaka from METI Japan to sign the MOC and make comments to the MOC. Mr. Tanaka, please, the time is yours. So I will sign now. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, first, first of all, I would like to extend my sincere ap appreciation to Vice President, uh, Mr. Bambang Susantono, and his team at the uh, uh, Asian Development Bank. For a sustainable development in the ASEAN region, it is indeed critical to promote energy transition primarily through energy conservation, improvement of energy efficiency, and further deployment of renewable energy. For achieving energy transition, three key components, namely technology, policy, and finance, need to be synergized. Finance is particularly important. The energy transition can be achieved only when finance is efficiently mobilized. 
with the recent dramatic shift towards a global carbon neutrality by 2050, including in Japan, METI recognizes the importance of transition technologies and finance. In this context, transition means step-by-step -step approach to be taken based on specific conditions and situation in each country or region until the carbon neutrality is finally achieved. With that recognition, we have just started a study group aimed at aiming to uh, develop domestic guidelines for transition finance on the basis of existing uh, international guidelines. And also, we will prepare roadmaps for transition finance in relevant industry sectors in a sequential manner. We will publicize these guidelines and roadmaps so they can be used uh, to enrich uh, CEFI activities. Transition finance is a very important concept for Asia, where its economic structure is uh, constructed primarily by emission-intensive industries. With its unique conditions and situation in the region, its decarbonization cannot be achieved without such finance. I am so much encouraged by today's signing of this MOC, which highlights the importance of transition technologies, such as energy conservation, improvement of energy efficiency, and further deployment of renewable energy and of private financing to support such technologies. CEFIA is a useful platform to facilitate transition technologies and finance in Asia. Transition finance will be one of the key pillars of CEFIA activities. ADB and METI are both important stakeholders for CEFIA. As their conversation and joint activities on transition technologies and finance will be deepened, CEFI activities will be further vit vitalized. I hope transition finance will spread, spread widely in Asia uh, through CEFI activities on the basis of this monumental uh, MOC. I would conclude by wishing all of you to stay safe in these difficult times under this COVID-19. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Vice Minister Tanaka, for your kind remarks. Now I would like to invite both Mr. Susantono and Mr. Tanaka to hold the MOC towards the camera for a photo session. I will lead the photo session. One, two, three. Once more. One, two, three. Thank you very much, Mr. Susantono and Mr. Tanaka. Thank you very much. I am delighted that the signing has been successfully completed. I very much look forward to the inputs to Sophia and also closely working with both ADB and METI to collectively enrich SEFIA activities. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, to continue with our session three now, I would like to invite our moderator and hand over the moderation task to Dr. Ayuha Sinji from Mitsubishi Research Institute for the third part of the session. He is currently Research Director, Climate Change Solution Group, Sustainability Division of Mitsubishi Research Institute Incorporated. He provides solutions related to sustainable finance to both public and private sectors are partners. Dr. Ayuha Sinji, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for a nice introduction for me. I humbly accept the moderator role at the session three. The session three title is How to Mobilize Finance for Decarbonization Pathways. Let me briefly explain why we place finance as the central role uh, at this session three. In order to facilitate clean energy technology, I think finance is an indispensable factor because projects will not develop further uh, if there is no finance. Also, recently, green finance has been increasing and gathered interest, but we hear uh, that the, there are many uh, the obstacles and the problems to uh, revitalize the green finance and the project. So taking finance as the central topics here is timely 
and has the rationale. Under limited time, as the slide shows, I want to focus on three topics today. The first, I want to discuss what role is expected for the government in a de developing the finance to clean energy project. Uh, the clean project finance is at the nation to face. Effective rule making is an important issue to be approached for further development. Second, I want to introduce a concept of transition finance, an inclusive concept of covering broader industries for making a transition into decarbonized society more sustainable. And I want to discuss what role this concept can play in ASEAN perspective. Third, I want to discuss about measuring the impact of finance. Now the green finance has been developing rapidly. One issue financial institutions face is how to measure the effectiveness of such finance. However, we hear that uh, how to measure has not developed much. Uh, from this point of view, it is very worthy to discuss this topic here to share the current issue, progress, or thought of experts on this issue with the stakeholders and participants. To discuss uh, the, these very interesting topics, uh, I invite the five experts as presenters today, uh, both from public and private sector in this field. I hope that their presentations and expert expertise will be relevant to your interest and contribute to sharing the importance of finance for clean energy project with you. So first, let me introduce Mr. Nomoto uh, from Mitsubishi Research Institute. Mr. Nomoto is a senior research, researcher of Climate Change Solution Group, and he plays an indispensable role for Sephir project. Thank you always, Nomoto-san. Uh, with his presentation, he will explain the overview of Sephir, the ASEAN Green Finance, uh, risk and bottlenecks of finance uh, to be approached in ASEAN, and the position of Sephir and its direction in this field. So, Nobutu san, please take your turn. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you very much for kind introduction. Uh, I'm honored to have this precious time today. I'm Tetsuya Nomoto from Mitsubishi Research Institute, in charge of supporting for the Safety Secretariat, especially in the area of finance. I would like to share the idea about the issue related to the Korean energy finance. This is a part of activity under the Safety the market, uh, next slide please. <clears throat> the market of, for ESG and green finance is expanding in ASEAN. This is due to the huge demand for green related investment. And also the bond size is still small. However, their growth is remarkable. With the number of green bonds issued rapidly increasing, especially in Singapore. And the bonds and loan and the form of the SISUK a common in green finance. Next slide, please. So regarding the green investment opportunities, much amount of investment is required to realize NDC nationality de determined contributions. Estimate, estimated to $23 trillion are required for 21 emerging countries. Green finance also play an important role in this context. This estimate, which include Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines, show $1.14 million in expected green investment opportunity, particularly in areas such as rail and green building sectors. Next slide, please. So is a Safia has a position finance as a priority area for the promotion of, of cleaner energy business. As introduced by Ms. Nanet of ADFIAP in session one today, we are preparing to launch a flagship activity in the field of finance. On September 30 last year, a stakeholder meeting was held to serve as a starting point for discussion where bottleneck identification and the solution to promote the clean energy product were discussed. Then based on the interview with local financial institution, the current hypothetical bottleneck and solution were organized. 
uh, look at the slide is uh, uh, above the page is uh, one of the challenge as specific to the climate sector is a limited expert to organize a conceptual including green finance and transition finance and obtaining data based on these concepts and operationalize it. We believe that this will require awareness building and capacity building. The second is the issue of risk allocation and bankability. It may involve risk of and risk crystallized approach through the public-private partnership and the creation of opportunity through the establishment of platform for common investment. Third is the policy and the institutional aspect. This is expected to mitigate demand risk and the market risk by providing a common strategy and roadmap with the project pipelines. Next slide, please. So is a back to the CFR. Is a CFR is a program of the ASEAN Plus Three, and it's, it it is expected that activity will be promoted using it as leverage. CFR will strengthen the capacity of the clean energy finance in the region and work with a flagship project with a specific theme such as zero energy building and the energy efficiency technology in the factory and building, deepens the understanding of what is the risk and the enablers. By creating a roadmap for this area, CFR would like to show a direction and materialize and acceleration our activity. CFIA is also expected to establish a value sharing and collaboration platform as a local financial institution in collaboration with development financial institutions and other organizations. CFIA believes that the role of government is also important. The ASEAN Plus three governments are expected to remove major bottleneck and the barrier of cleaner energy finance through ensuring a stable, transparent, and integrated policy formulations. In addition, in addition to this, they are greatly expected to show their comment, commitment, encourage, and lead a social implementation of cleaner energy project by presenting a mid-term or long-term strategy and roadmap. Next slide, please. So this is a final slide for me. So finance activity at CFIA have just begun and are still in the developing stage. CFIA's goal is to serve as a hub for clean energy finance. To achieve this, we have identified two directions for our activity. The first one is enhancing the regional capability to attract the clean energy finance. And the second one is developing collaboration platform for accelerating clean energy finance. CFIA will continue to base its activity on this direction. And this is uh, for your additional information. We are also planning to hold a free webinar dedicated to CFIA finance activity on March 4th. So this will give you uh, some chance or deeper pre uh, chance to know about the deeper perspective on the major issue from the Korean energy finance in ASEAN. So we hope the audience will take the opportunity to participate, participate in our activities. So thank you very much for taking time today. So I really appreciate it for this opportunity and back to moderator Ayu Hassan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inomoto-san, for your presentation uh, covering the overview of the uh, ESC investment in ASEAN region and also the, the overview of the SFE activities. And from now, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Ms. Ogawa uh, from METI the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan. She is the Deputy Director of Economy, Environmental Economy Office. Ms. Ogawa has dedicated years of experiences to energy, market and finance in regulatory sphere. Currently, she is engaged in policy making of environmental finance. Today, she will explain the concept of transition finance, which METI announced recently as an important concept for making society more sustainable. So, Ogasam, uh, please take your turn. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction. My, my name is Motoko Ogawa. I'm in charge of environmental finance in Medi. I was fascinated when I, 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 heard, I heard CEFIA would include finance session today uh, in this forum. So finance is a driving force for introducing cleaner energy. 
Thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk to you today and introduce recent METI's uh, activities on climate innovation, in particular transition finance. At the uh, ceremony of MOC between METI and ADB, uh, Vice Minister Tanaka briefed on our uh, recent actions on transition finance. So in my session, I would like to develop a little bit, <laughs> a little more about it. Okay. Um, last October, uh, Prime Minister Suga of Japan pledged a cut in greenhouse gas emission to net zero by 2050. Since then in Japan, climate issues attract interest from industries more than ever. We addressed green growth strategy last year end. We will, active, we will activate all possible measures to achieve carbon, uh, carbon neutrality. Finance to the green uh, growth is one of the major pillars in the strategy. Today, I would like to talk on one of the hot environmental issues in Japan, that is transition finance. I hope this will be meaningful to our friends in ASEAN as well. Uh, please flip, uh, yes, please see the, this page. Uh, the importance of the climate innovation. This title is nothing special for you because you're very aware of the importance of climate innovation. But what I want to say here is also the carbonized society need to be achieved on global basis, the difficulty to achieve this international goal depends on industry structure and geographical conditions of each country. In fact, not all industries will be able to take a leap or jump towards a decarbonized society. Some industries do not have alternatives to realize carbon free. Therefore, they may need to reduce emissions by hard efforts, by applying transition technologies and utilizing innovation technologies. Japan has devoted itself to establish and enhance transition and innovation technologies so far. And those technologies should be able to contribute global direction of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, please next, go to the next page. Thank you. Uh, in Japan, in Japan, green bond market has, st has been st steadily growing to encourage investments in renewables. Oh, sorry, let, skip. Uh, sorry, uh, let me go back to this page. Uh, in September 2020, we published Climate Innovation Finance Strategy 2020. Let me brief on this strategy today. With regard to climate, uh, there are three areas to be improved. First, please look at the left side of the page. Ah, no, don't click. Um, first, green is for the business uh, with a cleaner pathway to realize zero or near zero to uh, zero GHG emissions, that is renewables. Second, transition. Transition is a shift towards decarbonization and carbon reduction by industries where real, uh, real zero emissions cannot be expected in the short term. Transition includes energy conservation. Third, innovation is research and development and social implementation of innovation for emission reduction, storage and reuse, that is non-continuous innovation such as carbon dioxide capture, utilization storage, CCUS, and artificial photosynthesis. Finance to them, that is to provide private funds to realize climate innovation, in addition to public funds as a catalyst, is a key to achieve SDGs and the Paris Agreement and realize decarbonized society. According to IEA's estimate, also that is not in the seat, about 70 trillion US dollar is required to achieve Paris Agreement by 2040 worldwide. It is obvious 
the amount cannot be fully covered by public funds. We consider it is reasonable, reasonable to attract ESG investment into climate innovation. Next page, please. This uh, graph shows most developed nations produce less CO2 within their nations as they depend on foreign imports in accordance with their shift of industrial structure. We need to consider CO2 emissions on global basis. We can imagine transition becomes essential to countries where carbon reduction is not easy in the short term due to the nature of their core industries, manufacturers, and high needs of electricity. Next slide, please. Thank you. In Japan, green bond market has been steadily growing to encourage investments in renewables. Japan published guidelines and has been proceeding a subsidy program. I understand many of ASEAN countries have made similar efforts. Transition comes next. Transition is a new challenge and there are fewer case examples of transition finance globally. Please see current status and climate uh, and challenges in the left. Common understanding on the concept definition of transition finance does not yet exist. Moreover, some express concern that transition finance is secondary to green. Some concern green washing, or I should say transition washing. Such concern is natural and adequate as the definition is not clear and such action is not yet proved reliable. It is of course realized that green is essential to achieve the target of Paris Agreement. Transition is not yet well realized as indispensable in a positive manner to achieve the Paris Agreement alongside green finance. Then when proceeding measures as described in the right side of the slide, transition need credibility. We are developing guidelines or principles for issuing transition bonds and loans in line with international principles. We set up a task force to issue the guideline together with the Ministry of Environment and the Finance Service Agency of Japan. Last week, we had the first meeting to discuss the skeleton of the guidelines in line with the international consensus, namely the handbook issued by ICMA, International Capital Market Association. We need a clearer vision for transition. We will also create roadmaps for high emitting industries. We need definition, diffusion of transition finance. For this purpose, we encourage investment by supporting case, exam, case cases of transition investments. Next slide, please. The last slide is the entire pathway showed in climate, innovate, uh, climate Innovation Finance Strategy 2020. Transition is not the only a segment of climate innovation, but important. We definitely need finance to it to realize uh, the change to the decarbonized society. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to discuss further later in this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ogawa, for your uh, presentation, which is very uh, comprehensive to uh, show Japanese government's uh, direction to the decarbonized society. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now the, uh, shared the concept of the transition finance. So that uh, we go to the next uh, presenter. Uh, Dr. Tsai, can you hear me? Uh, from yes. ASEAN Development Bank. Thank you very much. Uh, let me briefly introduce Dr. Tsai. Uh, thanks for participating today. The, Dr. Tsai is Chief of Energy Sector Group of ADB, and he's in charge of overall energy policy coordination and technical support to ADB energy sector operations. He has also been uh, developing energy sector knowledge work for ADB and interacts with worldwide energy sector partners. In his presentation, he will explain ADB's role in supporting low carbon transition in Asia and overview 
ADB's strategy, energy policy, and share ADB's current engagement of impact measuring. So, Dr. Tsai, please take your turn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, for the kind introduction. I would like to, uh, as uh, the moderator uh, mentioned, uh, explaining uh, ADB's role in supporting low carbon transition in Asia, in developing Asia, what I should say. Uh, let's next slide, please. Yes, uh, I will talk about uh, uh, basically uh, four items, starting with how we should uh, go about low carbon transition, what is the guiding principles for government, of course, for ADB, how ADB can support the government. Secondly, what ADB is uh, currently doing uh, in terms of financing and knowledge in clean energy, supporting clean energy transition. And thirdly, uh, how we measure our energy sector operations in terms of uh, uh, indicators, quantitative indicators. And lastly, as uh, our vice president has mentioned in earlier session, that ADB is currently reviewing its new reviewing its old, uh, ongoing energy policy and prepare a new policy uh, right now. So let's start with the next slide. Uh, of course, ADB has a lot of partners. And I, I think uh, uh, the very important uh, global in, uh, commitment is Paris Agreement and uh, Climate uh, uh, and uh, Sustainable Development Goal. But between this, I think uh, energy is at the center of, of these two global commitments. So ADB uh, has prepared our own strategy 2030, reflecting the global commitment as uh, in climate and in sustainable development. Next play. Next page. ADB is very much a client uh, uh, oriented. We do what the government, developing member countries, request from ADB. From our understanding, the government has very, very important, important role in promoting uh, clean energy <clears throat> and also clean energy financing uh, by establishing a legal framework, a regulatory framework for renewable energy. Many countries have passed uh, renewable energy laws, and that's a very important step. And based on the law, we have to have uh, planning, long-term planning for renewable energy expansion. And of course, we need to promote financing for the renewable energy financing, and we need the financial incentives and regulatory support for renewable energy. And it is very important to have renewable energy generation integrated to the power system. So we need to make sure the network connection is working. Of course, uh, uh, in, in those uh, renewable energy projects, there are risks involved, like in any uh, other project, but renewable energy has its own type of uh, risk. So some form of government support, uh, uh, utilities uh, uh, signing of uh, PPA would be important for uh, mitigating this risk. And lastly, of course, uh, carbon pricing is very strong uh, instrument to uh, orient uh, investment in, in clean energy. We need to have a verification system for greenhouse gas emissions. This is one of the indicate measurement. We need to have it in place. Uh, a key issue to attract financing, we to summarize what I've said, it's very important to have a stable policy and regulatory framework. I sometimes I like to say that uh, intermittent renewable energy uh, has a technical solution. We can have energy storage to uh, uh, to have uh, uh, and digital systems to resolve the problem of uh, uh, intermittency of renewable energy, but uh, the policy has to be stable. We have to avoid the intermittency of energy policy. So uh, a transparent, predictable policy is very important to attract finance. Next page, please. Uh, guiding principles for energy sector lending. Uh, ADB strategy 2030 uh, described seven operational areas. If I can read very quickly, poverty reduction, gender equality, 
uh, climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation, livable cities, rural development, governance, and regional cooperation. You will see that the uh, energy sector is not one of these seven priorities, but energy sector has to support each and every of these uh, seven priorities by supporting uh, poverty reduction, making sure gender equality is incorporated, climate uh, mitigation, of course, by supporting renewable energy, making cities more livable and so on. There is a role for energy to play uh, in each of these uh, uh, priorities. And in terms of long-term target, ADB plan to have 70% 75% of all our operations in supporting climate mitigation and adaptation by 2030, 75% of our project. And 80 billion overall lending from nine, 2019 to 2030 to combat climate change. This is the overall amount and target we have in ADB for supporting uh, climate uh, mitigation and adaptation climate financing. Next page. Uh, in energy sector, specifically, we are specifically supporting clean energy, renewable energy, energy efficiency. When we say clean energy at ADB, we mean renewable energy plus energy, energy efficiency. At the same time, we have to maximize our support to uh, elect electricity access, but also clean cooking access for all because Asia has still a considerable number of people without access to electricity and about 45% of people without access to clean cooking. So this is a very uh, serious issue we have to tackle. And also ADB will continue to support policy reform to put in place the necessary reform and policies in place, as I mentioned in the earliest slide, that to support clean energy development. Next page, page, please. Next page. I'll talk about ADB's uh, lending. Uh, overall, we are providing uh, last year in 20, year 2020, our lending is $4.2 billion, and of which uh, $2 billion is in uh, uh, climate financing, clean energy financing. And the difference between the 4.2 and 2 billion I would say this should be considered as a, a transition financing, as uh, our previous speakers has mentioned. I'm, I'm learning the concept of uh, transition financing. I find it uh, very uh, important to justify on our long-term, uh, achieving our long-term vision on our way toward that long-term goal. We need to finance the 100% uh, uh, zero carbon renewable energy, but also at the same time we make sure that uh, everything we do is, you know, going towards uh, the final goal. So the transition, the concept of transition is important. I'm willing to learn more today and also see how at the ADB we can, you know, mobilize uh, uh, climate financing, but also in terms of supporting our countries in uh, transitioning to the uh, long-term uh, objectives. So uh, this is the uh, overall trend in ADB's lending. Uh, I must mention that uh, uh, 2020 is an exceptional year and going to 2021 is still uh, under the pandemic. Uh, we have seen, looking back, we have seen renewable energy is showing uh, very much uh, uh, strong performance. Uh, like uh, renewable energy is is like uh, resilient to the pandemic. Uh, however, many energy utilities suffered uh, this financial uh, liquidity issue due to the drop in demand and difficulties in collecting revenue. We also see in some countries uh, uh, the project implementation have been delayed uh, in the initial months of the pandemic. I I'm happy to see many of these projects are, are being brought uh, back uh, uh, on track. Uh, but one lesson learned is that we need to support developing countries in building their own capacity. Uh, if everything is dependent on, on import, everything is dependent on uh, uh, international consultants, uh, the renewable energy is, is not 
sustainable, we need to have the local capacity. This is one important uh, lesson learned. Next page, please. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Tsai, uh, apologies for inter interruption, but uh, you have another three minutes, please. Ah, okay, uh, next page, uh, please, uh, because I have uh, mentioned this earlier. Next page. Uh, this is uh, about our operation in Southeast Asia. It's very much uh, uh, consistent in different countries, re promoting renewable energy and efficiency. Next page, please. Uh, knowledge work, we are not only providing financing, but also writing uh, uh, knowledge handbooks. We publish handbooks on microgrids, smart grids, waste to energy, energy storage. We are preparing a handbook on hydrogen, energy, uh, uh, renewable energy, distributed renewable energy, and also a COVID response. Next page, please. Uh, we are also supporting clean energy innovation challenges. So this is a new instrument at ADB. We provide grant financing to pilot some of the high-level technology fund with support of uh, our high-level technology fund uh, supported by government of Japan. Next page. Next. Yeah, next page, please. Uh, we measure uh, climate and energy access impact at ADB by this uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, numbers. One is how much we add capacity in renewable energy, 3.4 gigawatt last year, and how much uh, uh, CO2 reduction we achieved, 6.9 million dollars next last year, and also uh, electricity savings and uh, electric power generated from uh, renewable energy. Next page, please. Next page. Uh, I will conclude on, on this play, page that the energy sector uh, policy has to be updated. Uh, we are currently in the process of uh, uh, going to uh, public consultation. The key questions we ask from our stakeholders are these four questions. What are the emerging technologies innovations in the next 10 years that will, change, will be the game changer? What are the cross-sector issues, energy, water, transport, nexus, and others? should be considered in the new policy. And what are the priorities need from developing countries, like whether transition financing, climate financing, what would be the need from countries, and what are the long-term impact of the COVID-19? These are questions for consultation. Next page, please. I will uh, conclude on next page. And this is consultation publicly available on the website. I'm also uh, very much uh, clean uh, receiving your comments. Uh, uh, on, uh, from all stakeholders, participants, and from government for us to prepare our policy, new policy, in better position to support developing countries in uh, long-term climate financing, but also going to that objective with uh, transition financing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tsai, for your very insightful presentation covering from uh, ADB's uh, say support to government government and uh, to uh, say the uh, consultation uh, to the uh, public. Thank you very much. We now understand the uh, ADB's commitment and also the contribution to the carbonized energy sector. So now let me introduce uh, Ms. Chan uh, from DBS. Ms. Chan, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Uh, can people hear me as well from my side? Thank you very much, Ms. Chun, uh, participating from Singapore. Uh, let me briefly introduce Ms. Chun today. Uh, she's uh, the head of sustainability international banking group of DBS. And then DBS launched the world first sustainable and a transition finance framework for a commercial bank in just uh, last July and has been engaging by uh, providing finance to a wider range of industries to contribute to a smooth transition to decarbonizing society. So today, Ms. Chun will explain the overview of its concept of transition finance and DBS engagement and the challenge in providing uh, financial solutions for climate issues to customers. So Ms. Chun, uh, please Certainly. take your turn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to Sophia for, invita uh, for the invitation to DBS. We have been thinking about transition finance since 2019. 
and culminating in the launch of our sustainable and transition finance framework and taxonomy last July. Before I go into the framework, I want to provide an overview of how we approach sustainability at DBS. The way we describe it to our investors, customers, NGOs, and regulators in how we operationalize sustainability is in terms of our three pillars. The first pillar, responsible banking. We believe as a commercial bank, the leverage that we have, the influence that we have over our customers is in the way we allocate capital. We want to allocate capital towards activities that promote sustainable development and also to shy away from sectors and activities that are in breach of climate goals and other sustainability considerations. The second pillar that we have is responsible business practices. Here, we want to make sure that we do what we preach, our procurement, our uh, HR function to position the bank as the employer of choice, our consumption and natural resources use at our branches and premises all come into play. We want to make sure that we do to do what we preach. The third pillar, creating social impact, is largely done through the work at our DBS Foundation, nurturing social enterprises through grant making in the region. Next slide. Today, when we talk about transition finance, we will be focusing on the loan market and especially on the two types of structuring that we have seen has been adopted widely in the market. The first one on the left, use the proceeds specific loans. So these will be the green loans, or it could be an SDG loan. The entirety of the money borrow has to go towards earmark green activities. And the restriction on the user proceeds, make sure that the capital is funneled towards the activities that we want to see happen. And they are considered green or green enough in the eyes of the lenders. Then onto the sustainability link loan structuring. This type of credit facility allows the borrower to enjoy a potential upside, a reduction in interest rate when they meet a set of predetermined sustainability performance targets. And this type of structuring allows the borrower to use the money borrowed for whatever purposes they see fit. And this flexibility in the user proceeds uh, really has made this particular structuring very popular and attractive to many of our customers. When we apply the transition finance label or the transition label, we apply it in both ways, whether it is user proceeds specific, meaning that we could earmark specific projects, assets or activities that is considered transitional. Or it could be a sustainability link loan, whereby the KPI and the target set for the borrower is related to decarbonization for transition. Next slide. We know that transition finance, when we started thinking about it in 2019, is controversial. Some of the other speakers have also opined on this, that there are pockets of commentary that transition finance is inferior to green. Is it some sort of cop out to green finance that customers cannot go green and they still want to have some sort of publicity and they adopt the transition label? To us, that controversial that controversial com commentary is partly justified. I think transition, in order to be credible, we as a bank, as a lender and an allocator of capital, needs to make sure that it is transitioning to the ultimate objective of meeting the Paris Climate Agreement. The general trajectory would be to peak emissions by 2030 and to reach net zero by 2050. Now, of course, the long horizon, the long tenor that we extend in transition finance may not extend that far, but we still evaluate the overall strategy of our borrower and not just the specific asset that we are lending towards, that we call it transition. Next slide. The reason we feel that transition is particularly apt for Southeast Asia 
where DBS is the largest commercial bank by asset is because of these, the, the, what the charts are telling us. If you look at the portion that is red or gray, these represent the customers in those regions that are far from ready to meet Paris climate pledges. And if we disregard their contribution to the economy, how they make up the real economy, we will be disregarding a large part of economic activities. We know that in order to reach below two degrees, we need all hands on deck. We need every participant, heavy emitters, and also the traditional pure play green companies to all contribute to this effort. Next slide. If we look at by industry sector, again, you would see that a number of sectors, they still are very much reliant on fossil fuel use and many of them may struggle to find alternative and commercially feasible solutions that are green. Uh, so for example, with aviation, the fuel they use, whether they can adopt another type of energy dense hydrogen that is produced in a green manner is still decades away. The same with some of the mining and smelting operations in fact producing the metals of the future essential for battery and other types of storage such as aluminium and copper and nickel all those activities would come with a very heavy carbon intensity label as a result uh, next slide as a result we feel that transition finance is particularly important for the heavy industries. We want to have a framework in place to allow borrowers to go on a path of decarbonization that is credible. And they're able to communicate that clearly to their customers, to their regulators, and also to many of the efficacy groups. I think with transition finance, it is more than just about getting good PR. It is actually about good communication. And there is a small qualitative difference between communication and just good PR. We are not only paying lip service to doing transition. As I mentioned before, we do look at and evaluate when we ask about transitional credentials of the borrower, where are they transitioning to? As a result, since we launched the transition finance framework, we've had a lot of constructive discussions with customers. And we do find that for many of them, even by having that conversation is already a step forward and is the beginning of their journey on decarbonization. Next slide. Our framework focuses on heavy industries from metal production, oil and gas, aviation, chemicals, power generation to shipping. To use the example in power generation, I think one of the hotly debated topics is whether gas fire power generation could be considered transition. I would say that in many of the developed markets, if you look at the carbon intensity of the grid on average, gas fire probably would not be able to meet the requirements to be a credible transition. However, in many other developing countries in Southeast Asia, a gas fire power plant could complement the overall energy mix. Again, I think we need to look at the overall life cycle of that power project in question, and also the overall energy security consideration. Next. Uh, Ms. Chung, could you conclude mm. in a few minutes, please? Certainly. When we provide transition financing, we not only do it as a user process specific loan, we sometimes also offer it at a corporate level. And when we do label a corporate in transition, we do use three guiding principles. We need to see, first of all, that the customer may be divesting, exiting or decommissioning carbon intensive assets, or they could be diversifying into new business and work streams that would generate revenue away from fossil fuel reliant economic activities. And third, we want to see decarbonization in their own 
business as usual operations, how are they going to reduce the carbon intensity or the absolute emissions of their operations? Next. In the market, we have seen a number of utilities companies which have come out with transition bond in capital markets. So SNAM, Cadent and CLP, all of them have come out with transition bonds to do with gas fire power generation assets, or it could be pipeline infrastructure that can be retrofitted to cater for hydrogen use in the future. This goes to show that there is potential for transition finance to go broader and get critical mass in the market in attracting capital. Next. To conclude, I just want to show one example of how our taxonomy works. This taxonomy doesn't include every economic activity under the sun. This actually mirrors our own risk appetite statements for different sectors. And in using our own risk appetite statements, we look at the specific asset type and the asset transitional qualities to see whether the transition label may potentially apply. So the taxonomy is a basis for all our relationship managers to go out to engage with our customers and have the conversation with them to begin their decarbonization journey. Thank you very much. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Chun, uh, you are for your very, very impressive presentation covering the taxonomy of your uh, bank's transition finance and also the some examples and then also the current uh, uh, engagement by a DBS. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so let me uh, go to the next presenter, uh, Mr. Prakop uh, Pinencheron uh, from uh, Thailand. Uh, Mr. Prakop, can you hear me? Yes, clearly, yes. Thank you very much. So let me briefly uh, introduce Mr. Uh, Prakop. Uh, he's now the uh, head of global uh, corporate uh, banking and acting head of uh, investment banking of Bank of uh, Ayutthaya, uh, commonly uh, called currency in Thailand. So that uh, uh, we here, I want to keep calling uh, currency now. So today uh, he, he will explain the uh, currency's uh, engagement in ESG finance, overview uh, Thai's current situation of ESG finance, and show some interesting cases relating to ESG finance. So, Mr. Prakop, please uh, take your turn. Yeah, thank you very much um, for the kind invitation and kind introduction. So, we have quite limited time, so I'll try to summarize uh, what I have prepared, and hopefully I can send the, uh, the right message across. Uh, we are um, about 78% owned by MUFG. So in this context, we also mentioned about MUFG uh, assistant um, in our uh, Thailand uh, journey of the ESG financing as well. I would like to cover three um, key uh, topics. One is the uh, development of the ESG financing in Thailand. Um, uh, secondly, the importance of the government support uh, in terms of um, uh, ESG financing going forward. And uh, lastly, the measurement of the success of the ESG financing in Thailand. Um, let me turn to the next page. Just quickly, uh, page, um, next page. Uh, just to mention briefly about uh, our um, parent uh, company, uh, MUFG, uh, definitely uh, very committed to uh, ESG. And as you can see, that uh, we aim to be a most trusted financial group. And a uh, very key component of that is uh, to really uh, put in uh, sustainable finance goal and uh, MUFG have put in 20 trillion uh, yen in terms of sustainable financing goal and uh, of which uh, 8 trillion yen would be in terms of the uh, uh, environment. Uh, in addition, the second bullet, uh, the governance mechanism, we are also having a social policy and environmental framework in order to help us in terms of the lending to the uh, private sector. Uh, with that, uh, next page please. Kung Si. Kung uh, Si, uh, 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 we also adopt a similar um, uh, commitment and our mission is to be a leading regional financial institution with global reach, uh, committed responsibility to meet the needs of the customer and also serving society to sustainable growth. 
and uh, we want to be sustainable bank um, in Thailand. Next page, please. Um, we have a sustainable uh, mission, and in fact, we have a dedicated ESG person uh, in Thailand. And on the um, uh, three pillars here, environmental, we are committed to green financing, uh, water consumption, um, materials, and also energy saving. Um, the other two pillars are social and governance, which also we are consistently promoting on the social end. We have issued uh, gender bonds, and also uh, we have a subsidiaries in micro and nano finance, consumer finance, well, to promote on the social side. Next page, please. We also adopt uh, environmental the KPI, uh, KPI as our corporate uh, KPI. And um, we uh, also have the uh, guideline uh, of the lending. Uh, this is uh, uh, is coming out, uh, prohibit, prohibited transactions, um, uh, restricted transaction. This is related to uh, ESG, uh, prohibited, mean that we cannot lend at all. Restricted then uh, meaning we have to um, uh, find the um, uh, mitigations uh, to mitigate the SG risk and the positive list with the renewables energy and circular economy that we would wish to lend to. Next page, please. In terms of the um, uh, our track record, uh, I think in MUFG, uh, we want to do this area more and more. Lately, MUFG has been a green structuring advisor on the box that up there um, for recent transition in the region, uh, including some of the electricity companies in our group in Suku uh, and also in Thailand, um, Kingdom of Thailand. So you see the um, uh, the green um, bonds that uh, we are we have been doing with MUFG, and hopefully there's going to be more. Next page, please. Next, I would like to talk about the um, growth of the uh, ESG bonds in Thailand. Uh, but I would like to note that in fact, uh, ESG financing or green financing has happened in Thailand for quite some time whereby the, the banks lend to renewable projects in Thailand. Uh, however, I think lately uh, there has not been much of the um, uh, bankable projects. Uh, it represents a lot of uh, risk in terms of the demand risk and also a lot of projects are, are very small and the sponsor can do corporate finance in, in terms of financing those. In the bond market, however, um, there's been the exponential growth. If you can see this is the overall uh, ESG bond market in the past three years. It's had triple uh, to from 2018 to 2019, 10 to 30 billion, and last year was phenomenal uh, to 96, uh, 86 billion uh, Thai baht. And um, I think the reason is mainly because of um, I think I mentioned before, private company expanding more renewable, sustainable business and looking for financing. And secondly, I think um, we have uh, Supra, SB, ADB, IFC has played important role in driving this. Uh, ESG and green financing uh, in Thailand. And uh, lastly, we have uh, internal investor who are um, looking for ESG investment. And typically, these uh, internal investors are linked to multinational companies uh, uh, on asset management and also life insurance. Uh, last year was a remarkable year because uh, Ministry of Finance in Thailand decided to uh, set up an ESG bond framework and also issue a total of 50 billion Thai baht bond. And um, uh, this is send a very strong message to the overall uh, stakeholder in the markets. And um, uh, Kingdom of Thailand, Mr. Finance has also dedicated 15 year tenure benchmark to be ESG bond, uh, we call ESG LB. And the uh, latest I heard is that this ESG LB, which is 15 year benchmark dedicated to ESG, uh, have been uh, uh, very much wanted by the uh, local institutional investor. So uh, I would say that this is a very uh, good um, uh, growth that we have so far in the local market. In terms of the challenge, I will mention later in the later session so that I will not uh, uh, um, uh, repeat it again. Next, please. In terms of our uh, Gung Si uh, and MUFG here in Thailand, uh, last year we uh, issued social bond called gender bond um, uh, to the um, user proceed is to support the SME who, um, you know, uh, promote to promote the um, uh, gender uh, equality and um, you know a woman uh, who is the CEO or majority of the organization is a woman then uh, we would let them proceed to. Um, last year 2020 again a remarkable year whereby I think a reputable company in Thailand have uh, issued uh, ESG bonds including Kingdom of Thailand, uh, Rush Group, uh, PTT and also GPSC. 
And on the bottom note is that the, the market is also growing in terms of the sustainability link loan. And uh, we are now working uh, with uh, Thai Union, our clients um, as a joint mandate lead arranger, joint book runner, and joint sustainability coordinator uh, in terms of uh, leading the transactions to raise the funds from both Thai and Japanese markets. So that the deal is now ongoing and should be closing very soon. Uh, next two page is the list of the deal in the market, which I probably like to skip given the interest of the town. I like to move the um, to page uh, 11. That I think this is uh, also uh, recognized by the international um, in terms of the uh, what uh, Thailand has done uh, for the ESG financing so far. Uh, next page, please. Um, so with that, I think the current situation of the ESG financing, let me summarize as follows. Uh, we are now having an awareness uh, by the um, borrower issuer in Thailand, Sovereign Kingdom of Thailand, uh, SOE, you have BAC and also NHA issuing uh, bond as well. Uh, in this uh, green and social, you also have co leading corporate issue already. Now, um, the situation on the sustainability bonds, uh, somewhat the demand is more on the institutional side. And I think I would like to see uh, this happen on the retail investor side, investor side because retail investor represent a big portion in the Thai bond markets. Um, in terms of the regulations, SEC is in the process of issuing SLB uh, bond issuance regulation. Uh, I think there was a uh, online uh, seminar just last week um, to promote this, and I think the uh, regulation should come out in the first quarter of this year, so about a couple months time. Uh, sustainability loan. Uh, we have uh, executed the transactions that I just mentioned. Um, foreign banks are really more um, uh, more supportive in terms of the, uh, or more serious, I would say, about this ESG or green financing compared to the local banks, which I think some way, somehow, the, the awareness of the local bank are coming. And um, I think we would like to see that happening more on the um, uh, local bank side. Um, I think the sustainability link loan will be something that we'll see more this year uh, from uh, Thailand. Um, in terms of regulations, uh, we have seen some good progress. Uh, we, uh, Bank of Thailand signed an MU with IFC to develop this framework, but still, I think we expect or we like to see more of the measurement coming out to support uh, this ESG financing. Next page, please. Um, this one, I think, is uh, just a quick example of uh, what is Thai SEC in the middle and also Thai BMB um, support the, the green financing or ESG in terms of the, um, the fees or the subsidy. They waive the fee for the filing and also for the listing uh, reduced in some cases. Next, please. I would like to talk about um, the challenge here, which um, on the uh, issuer borrower side, uh, from what I see uh, from this uh, point going forward is about the application of the ESG to their respective industry. Of course, the green um, is uh, probably clearer for the, for the people who, who operate in the power sector, but in terms of the um, other sector, for example, like telecom, et cetera, how do this uh, apply? I think the issuer need to understand, and this is something that um, we would like to help them with our MUT expertise. Uh, secondly, what we see a challenge is that the connectivity between the finance side and the engineering side, because we are talking about very technical aspect uh, when we want to do uh, this um, sustainability link or green kind of the um, uh, financing. There are a lot of technical issues. And the cost benefit, of course, on the issuer perspective, they also want to uh, make sure that they get the lower cost compared to uh, the normal bond, which we start to see that because, as I mentioned, the institutional investor have been key in pushing and investing investment in the, um, the green financing area. Sustainability bond, um, uh, I think the good news is about the uh, SLB regulation coming out, but again, it's untested. I think we have to watch closely and also provide feedback to the SEC how to make the regulations uh, work um, in order to uh, grow this market more. Uh, sustainability loan, I touched on some point already about the local banks, um, and uh, I think this is about the awareness and the commitment that we have to work together with them in order to increase that more. And um, on the regulation side, uh, as I mentioned a little bit, um, we expect to see uh, MOF and BOT uh, coming up with more incentive to support uh, this sustainability or green financing or ESG. 
Uh, one point I haven't mentioned is on the SPO and external reviewer, which so far we have only uh, dealt with uh, international firms. Uh, so far, there's only one uh, local firm, Twist, that's trying to uh, that have set this up for the green financing and also uh, to be a SPO and external reviewer. Uh, we have yet to see in their, their, uh, their work coming out, but I uh, understand they are in another process of uh, talking with the potential issuer. Um, next session, please. I would like to mention about um, the government support, and I think this is extremely uh, important. We have uh, a very good uh, two years, three years in terms of the bond market for ESG growing. Uh, I think from this point forward, I, I would like to draw attention to how do we move it in a more effective way and meaningful way. And from my perspective and experience, um, I, I would like to see uh, various uh, ministries or the um, government agency get together uh, in Thailand, at least energy, environmental, uh, industry, um, Ministry of Finance, Battle Thailand, etc., to prioritize the sector. Um, we have seen a lot of deals coming out, but again, uh, the significance of it, I think it remains in question mark. Um, but having said that, uh, there are deals in the market on the ESG rather than none. But um, it would be helpful if the government can get together and prioritize the sector and really promote sustainable, sustainability financing. Uh, secondly, uh, provide incentive to support the um, uh, this kind of financing. How do the government um, uh, get involved in terms of the uh, cost saving to the borrower issuers, uh, tax subsidy, third party, I think there's a long list of it. Um, capital requirements uh, from the investor perspective or from a financial intermediaries, uh, what can be done in order to uh, incentivize investor to uh, buy of the banks to lend this kind of loan more. Uh, last point is on the taxonomy. And again, I think we are facing a difference of the local standard and the international standard, for example, EU. So when we when we deal with um, uh, SPO or external reviewer who have experience in the offshore, um, there's there often a gap uh, with the uh, onshore practice and also the local uh, kind of standard. So. I think on this end, probably a local verifier would be uh, something that helps. Um, workshop training to enhance ESG and awareness and application is also very important. Uh, last page, please. Um, next one. Um, in terms of the measurement of sustainability uh, financing success, um, I, I'm giving uh, three topics here. I think one is that the um, uh, ESG financing and what we have uh, discussed so far, how is it significant compared to the borrower and the issuer overall business? Um, and this comes with the balance between the achievable and ambitious KPI set. Um, I think a lot of companies, the good thing is that they are really want to talk to us more about how do ESG or green apply to um, their financing. At the same time, they are so concerned that if they commit to something that they cannot deliver, it doesn't look good as well. So this is very important in terms of um, how do we strike a balance between achievable uh, goals and also ambitious goals. This is often discussed with the verifier. And um, significant of uh, this um, uh, parameter agree, how is it uh, compared to overall the business that the borrower or issuer operating in. Secondly, I mentioned about local standard, national standard, and this is very important. Um, I still see a big gap between um, uh, the current situation in Thailand compared to the international. And um, I think perhaps the um, local verifier or the government who can help link uh, the knowledge on the uh, environmental industry or energy side with the financing side uh, would be very helpful. And uh, the last point on this one of the measurement is again, it's about monitoring and report, uh, which we typically, investors typically rely on verifiers um, but again, the data has been supported by the borrowers. Um, so, and this impact the cost and return to the all stakeholders. So this is an important point, but I think for the well-known company in Thailand uh, with a good uh, governance, um, we can uh, uh, be quite comfortable with the, uh, with the integrity of the data and also the report. In summary, um, I would like to leave um, the, this um, presentation in a few bullet points. One is the ESG financing, uh, has grown very significantly in Thailand. So I think uh, this is very important and I would like to draw attention from the government agencies to really get together, prioritize the sector and then give the right incentive in order to promote this ESG financing further. 
the challenge um, uh, would always be there in terms of the uh, you know the um, local international standards which we can look at the verifier and uh, I think the most important that the important one is about the bankable deals which um, I think we really need to look into how do we make uh, this green financing uh, bankable as well uh, similar to the success that Thailand have before in the IPP uh, kind of financing and now if you talk about green financing and EST how do we make all this um, uh, bankable and acceptable to not only the local banks but also international bank community in order to speed up the growth of the ESC financing in Thailand so with that thank you very much hope I didn't spend too much time thanks very much no, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prakop, uh, to make a very, very informative and a comprehensive presentation about your bank. And we are, we are now understand uh, uh, how deeply the CRUCI is engaging in uh, green finance, and which is really uh, nice for us and then also the uh, participants. Thank you very much. Uh, so that now, uh, again, so thank you, Benji, for all our presenters today. And then now, the time has come for the Q&A session. So uh, we have today five panelists uh, here, uh, Ms. Ogawa uh, from METI, and Dr. Tsai uh, from ADB, and Ms. Chung from DBS, and Mr. Prokop uh, from Kunsi. So they are all uh, presenters today, and Mr. Muto from MUBK Bank. Uh, allow me to introduce Mr. Muto uh, quickly as he participates here uh, from here. Uh, Mr. Muto is Global Head of Structured Finance and Managing Director of MUFG Bank. He is now globally leading project finance, aviation shipping finance, and ECA trade finance. Uh, thank you very much for participating in today's forum. And I expect that Muto-san will add an international perspective uh, to our discussion today. So, uh, as I mentioned at the introduction, I pointed out three uh, main discussion points as this session. The government role, the concept of transition finance, and how to approach a measurement of climate impact. First, uh, and then uh, let me add uh, one thing. So, uh, Ms. Chun uh, from Singapore uh, is participating, but uh, unfortunately, because of the manufacturing of the system, so she attend only voice. So uh, let me apologize for this. Uh, first, I want to discuss the government role for facilitating clean energy finance. Uh, in this topic, I would like to ask first, uh, Mr. Prakop, uh, your opinion about whether a government policy is necessary for promoting greener finance, or uh, could you share what type of support or reg regulation is helpful uh, from a financial point of view? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, probably um, if I can show the slides uh, once again on uh, page uh, 15. Um, uh, I think uh, this is uh, the probably answer some of uh, your questions and uh, I would probably look for uh, a further support uh, from our experience here. Uh, we see that the, the borrower are very enthusiastic uh, in terms of um, talking to, to us about how to apply the ESG or the green financing into their respective industry. Um, I think at the same time we also see uh, various government agencies trying to uh, issue the incentive, like uh, I mentioned before, like uh, SEC um, try to come up with the SLB, sustainability link bonds, and also the um, uh, lower cost in terms of the applications uh, funds to SEC, um, Thai BMA as well. As I said. Now, I think the next step that um, I personally like to see is that um, how do we really um, uh, have a, a common goal uh, between uh, what the Ministry of Energy, Ministry of uh, Environmental, and Ministry of East Indian Industry is moving towards its commitment in the ESG, uh, and how the regulator on the finance side um, can uh, come up with the incentive to promote the prioritized sector. Uh, meaning that, you know, I, I really want to see the, um, uh, the ESG financing that we are doing have a more impact to the Thailand in terms of the overall, i.e., um, you know, uh, decarbonize uh, 
uh, deforestation or with a reduction of greenhouse uh, gas emissions. So, um, with the government having a big uh, goal um, as a country, then um, I think the incentive of the finance side uh, to support uh, on the real sector uh, can start to be materialized. I mentioned some of the examples that um, that we put here, but uh, I personally am not a big fan of the um, of the tax uh, incentive that much because I think the key is to have a people or a stakeholder really understand and you know and uh, and and invest and issue these kind of bonds. But this will temporarily measure that um, the governments on the uh, finance side uh, can can promote the right sector. And capital requirements is also another thing for financial intermediaries and also uh, digital investors like um, life insurance. Um, and the third point, I think, is how do we bridge the gap between local standard and the international standard? Uh, to have an international verifier verify on the international standard, sometimes it's really miss out a lot of opportunities for the local Thai uh, who want to do uh, green financing or yeast financing. So this is probably the three points that I like to emphasize again and answer the question. I hope I answer some part of it. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Prokop, for really relevant uh, answer to my question. And then, so let me uh, ask uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Tsai uh, from the public point of view of government pro. So both of you are pro government side. So that uh, could you share your experience of supporting government or uh, opinion uh, to uh, relating to a uh, Mr. Krakopokop's comment. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the question. I mentioned in my presentation that ADB as a development bank, we do fi provide financing. But at the same time, I think a very important part of ADB's job is to share knowledge, best practice, best policy practice uh, in among the countries. So uh, I think I will give you one example that ADB is currently doing to support uh, uh, providing information to government on the way to achieve our long-term uh, uh, decarbonization uh, objective. Currently, ADB is studying, uh, making a study on different part of the Asia region and selected uh, Asian countries on the outlook and roadmap of achieving Paris uh, alignment, uh, enhanced NDC, not just NDC, but NDC has to be enhanced, how to meet the higher target. So we will provide the technologies options for different countries. In different countries, technology mix is a little bit different. And we'll also provide the uh, financing assessment, how much this transition would cost and how much, of course, ADB can contribute, that's going to be small, but ADB can play a role in mobilizing, coordinating commercial and private sector uh, capital investments. So uh, with, with this study is one example that how ADB can support government in formulating their long-term plan, in formulating their, their policies. By the way, I also want to mention in every ADB loan project, we usually have a policy angle, policy dimension, meaning that uh, by in investing in some infrastructure like uh, transmission lines, renewable energy project, for example, infrastructure investment, we also ask support government in implementing appropriate necessary policy framework that will provide a larger uh, space for, for private sector, for other uh, financiers to come in. So uh, I think uh, uh, ADB is very much uh, our development uh, bank. Uh, we are in development business. Policy dialogue, policy support is very, very important part of our work in every project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Tsai, uh, for a really, uh, say, uh, relevant to the the importance of the government, the private sector's role uh, to, I say, develop uh, a nice uh, policy framework. Thank you very much. Uh, so that uh, because of the limitation of the time, so that uh, let me allow to go to the uh, second topic. Though I want to continue this discussion. So the second topic is transition finance.
I understand the concept of transition finance is to cover a broader range of industries so that the transition uh, to decarbonized society is more sustainable. At this time, uh, being a greener becomes a buzzword in the financial industry, and I think that the concept of transition finance seems a little bit unique and challenging. Uh, from uh, the perspective, I would like to ask Ms. Chun uh, your opinion on how effective the concept is from ASEAN perspective, or uh, could you share DBS experience after launching this new concept? Sure. After we launched the framework and the taxonomy on transition finance, we have started speaking to our customers in some of the sectors that we highlighted, for example, oil and gas, mining and metals, steel producers, the smelters. And we have found that um, customers kind of fall into two categories. Uh, the first category of customers are very interested because they have been thinking themselves that how could they also uh, joined in the effort to address climate change and be recognized for doing so. And doing a sustainable finance transaction is one way of communicating that vision, their strategy to their customers and other stakeholders. And then there is a second category of customers whereby they find the requirements that we set for them in order to earn that transition label. Uh, very onerous. For example, we do demand that we evaluate not just the individual economic asset that we are financing to be of enough transitional credentials. We also look at the company's overall strategy and the effort to quantify the abatement potential. And the steps to do the quantification uh, requires sometimes the help of external consultants. It would incur additional costs. And as a result, that has become a hurdle to some of the customers. All in all, I would say that the reception that we received from customers is very positive. And we think that as there is critical mass, as there is a greater number of cu customers who would be looking to do transition finance, it would have a signaling effect to their peers. Uh, that's exactly what we have witnessed when we do sustainability link loans or green loans. As soon as one customer has done it, their peers would come up with suggestions to the bank to say, ah, I know that my competitor has done this. I am also interested in doing so. So I think once the, get, once the ball gets rolling, uh, that will have produce a very big signaling effect to the industry. Ms. Jung, thank you very much for your really interesting comment that the uh, uh, customer uh, accepted really positively and uh, uh, this new uh, concept is also uh, contributing to uh, driving a customer to the more greener uh, direction. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, let me uh, ask uh, Mr. Uh, Muto, uh, based on your international experience about the, the this new uh, concept of transition finance and also the, the how the MEFG Bank are doing in this uh, ESG finance and also the, the how how do you feel about the uh, transition finance in terms of international perspective? Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ayuha san, and uh, I hope the mic is on. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for everyone for this opportunity today. Um, I'm very delighted to be part of the panel. Um, although um, Prakop san quickly mentioned about the MUFG because I didn't have a presentation, allow me to um, give one uh, introduction for MFG uh, for, for those who are not familiar. MFG Bank is the Japan's largest bank with offices throughout Japan and in more than 40 countries around the globe. And for Asia, we are very committed as our mother market um, with close to 70 offices outside of Japan. Um, we have special focus and commitment in the ASEAN region uh, with our investments in our friends or partner banks, like uh, Krunsui, as mentioned, um, in Thailand, and Bank Tanomon in Indonesia, Vietin Bank in Vietnam, and Security Bank in the Philippines. And with regards to ESG financing, um, quickly mentioned by uh, Prokop-san, but uh, we are the first financial institution in Japan 
uh, to set a numerical target for sustainable financing. Um, having set a target of 20 trillion yen, or approximately 200 billion US dollars from 2019 to 2030, um, we had made significant progress in the first year with a current total of close to 4 trillion yen. And in the area of uh, environmental financing, we are consistently one of the largest renewable energy project financier and also underwriting and marketing uh, green financing, such as green bonds or sustainability linked loans. Um, recently, it was announced last year's uh, sustainable link loans league table in Asia. And we're glad to say that um, we were we jumped up from maybe beyond 10 to number three this year. And actually, was, that was just behind uh, DVS, who was number two. So I'd like to congratulate to uh, Ms. Chun, Yolanda. Um, very good efforts, and let's work together um, for this uh, efforts. Um, in terms of transition finance, um, you know, it's been said throughout this day that uh, it's the importance for this transition finance in the Asian region including Japan, is very um, unique compared to the other parts of the world. Um, I can't agree more that we need to make a step approach, a stage approach to achieve decarbonization of our clients. Um, MUSG, as mentioned, given our international uh, presence around the globe, uh, we would like to um, utilize our global presence and the expertise to promote transition finance throughout the ASEAN region. And as previously mentioned, I think one of the key tasks or um, roles that we can support is to make be a bridge between the international finance community and the ASEAN region finance community in the private sector world. So I think that's one point I can mention. I can't agree more on Ms. Chun's comments on engagement with the clients and the customers. Um, we hear from our customers that uh, with significant CO2 emission, that they're concerned uh, that they are not, they may not be able to obtain financing in the future at all. Um, we always need to keep in mind uh, financial inclusion. It's not clearly mentioned in part of SDGs, but I think it's a hidden theme for our, our, uh, the finance community to achieve the sustainable development goals, um, financial inclusion is key. Um, we would like to support on that as well. And we also, in terms of transition finance, um, it's early discussions with our clients, but one of the questions we get is, as mentioned in previous presentations, that uh, the definition of transition finance is not clear. What is transition finance? What is not transition finance? What can be credited, what cannot be? We need to set rules, um, as mentioned by our uh, senior executives in, from METI. Um, the international guidelines, or following the international guidelines, but also taking into account the uh, the local unique situation, and adjusting the uh, uh, efforts to such a policy. We're, we're happy to, uh, and we're actually supporting the Japanese government's efforts to establish such policy. So we will continue to do that. Um, last but not least, um, we are uh, in our efforts of facilitating the transition finance. We'll be in close touch with the governmental agencies like our great friends at ADB and other, other governments and also our partner banks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Muto, uh, for your uh, say the mentioning the MEFG's engagement in uh, SG, AESG finance and also the, uh, covering the, the position and the effectiveness of uh, transition finance uh, to a broader area. And this is really uh, good to hear for uh, in terms of SEFIA uh, initiative. Thank you very much. So uh, when it comes to transition finance, so we need to ask uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Ogawa, uh, your opinion, because the METI is really think of the importance of the transition finance. And then uh, interestingly, DBS also has a similar uh, concept and then similar name as you uh, developed so that uh, uh, it could be happy if you share the 
uh, opinion on the uh, how say their comments or uh, could you add more uh, to the transition finance? Uh, thank you very much. I was very much impressed by the uh, Ms. Chun's DBS uh, comments. They they started to engage in transition finance in 2019, and they have uh, kind of shared experience. And I also agree that she said uh, this is not just a PR, but this is uh, important to communicate between the customers and also the uh, the companies who need the uh, finance. So as uh, MUFG group will be uh, sharing the uh, will be sharing the experience maybe in the future more uh, using their network to have the actual transition finance cases in the future. So that will be a good input as well because we have not yet known what could uh, we could do for the transition finance. And also it is good that if the experience is shared, we can know what kind of policy is there and what kind of strategies is there and how they could communicate uh, among themselves to expand the possibilities. As, the, as uh, Dr. Chai uh, explained, uh, talked about, talked in his uh, presentation, we have already have some uh, transition finance in the current investment project in, in their portfolio as well. So the transition finance itself is not something new, but we already have in the general uh, investment or loan. But maybe we could elaborate more to enhance to have the money in flow into the transition that is very useful for the to meet the Paris Agreement. And Sevier is uh, doing a good work for the transition itself. They have uh, working on the uh, flagship project, and that is a part of the transition. So uh, if we could uh, talk about transition finance, besides their uh, discussion on the transition, that would be useful as well. So that Sevier can uh, contribute much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yogawa-san, uh, for kind of uh, say concluding word or about the uh, say transition uh, fine role of the transition finance. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, so my bad management, so that uh, the, say the time is approaching to the end. But uh, uh, allow me to expand a, a little bit uh, for this session three because one question remains. So I want to ask briefly about the the effectiveness and the importance of measuring uh, climate impact, so that. Uh, I want to ask three uh, panelists here, Mr. Prakop, uh, Dr. Tsai, and Mr. Muto. Uh, could you briefly uh, explain or uh, make a comment on the importance or a challenge or anything relating to uh, measuring the climate impact? So first, could you uh, share your comment, uh, Mr. Prakop? Hello, yes. Uh, just quickly for me, I think we have, I have also put in the uh, page 16 of my presentations. And um, I think this is a very important area of the, um, of the measurement uh, of the uh, success uh, in this um, uh, aspect. So I have outlined three challenges. I think the first one uh, is about the, um, uh, the certificate of the um, ESD or green financing itself to the borrower over all business. And again, I think, um, uh, don't take it negatively. I think we have to start it um, doing little by little. So we have to really encourage um, every you know stakeholders to to uh, to let it grow um, step by step. And uh, from my experience, uh, when we talk about this uh, significant, uh, I think we can talk uh, a lot. And uh, and in conjunction with the uh, the balance between uh, what is achievable and what is ambitious. Uh, because I think from the borrower perspective, of course, they don't want to commit to something that they cannot deliver in the ESG perspective. So, meaning uh, we often see um, uh, this ESG financing coming out in a way that uh, sending very strong message to the market, but um, sometimes we got question mark on the um, uh, how much that contribute to the overall uh, business, uh, meaning um, how much is it change uh, uh, positively from this uh, impact of the financing. Second point, I think I mentioned already on the uh, I think it's a gap between local and, and international standard. Uh, so, in, a, in order to promote more, um, I think probably the government uh, should look into the local verifiers who have the expertise of both technical 
and also on the financing side, I think that's a very uh, important. And, and all in all, um, I think, um, uh, as I mentioned before, I think to make an impactful success of the ESG financing, we really need to prioritize uh, the sector that uh, the government want to promote in order uh, for the deals, relevant deal to be come out, coming out to the market and that it can help the country overall in terms of uh, decarbonization uh, of our, our country. So thank you very much. Thank you, Prakop Sam. And then, so Dr. Tsai, uh, could you comment on the uh, ADB's uh, engagement in measuring the climate impact or your comments generally about the yes. uh, what um, the measurement should be? Th thank you. Uh, I very briefly, currently at the project level, we measure uh, in terms of climate uh, and its uh, impact, we measure four indicators. One is how much uh, newly added uh, uh, capacity of renewable energy, and this is one, and also how much is the generation from power, uh, renewable power. So because these are two different uh, indicators. Then we measure how much in energy efficiency project, how much we save energy in, uh, in uh, industry, in buildings, in transport, for example. So this is energy saving indicator. And lastly, very importantly, how much uh, uh, CO2 reduction we can achieve under a project. So on the project level, we report these four indicators, relevant indicators. Uh, nevertheless, I think at the country level, we need to build capacity, uh, help uh, our counterpart in building very uh, strong, reliable, and consi consistent uh, database for us to can, we, so to measure very precisely the impact of our policy at the policy level. Also, we, any policy will have impact on, 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 the, on the climate and also, of course, the development. So I think uh, uh, in the moving, uh, supporting government in specific project, we would like also to build the capacity of our of member countries in uh, uh, measuring the impact at the much broader uh, macro level on the country level. And this is uh, something ADB is supporting through our technical assistance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tsai. And so lastly, so please, uh, Mr. Muto, could you comment on the, the current situation of uh, impact measurement of MEFG? And also the, that is, there is a challenge to do that, so that could you share the experience for that? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ayo Hassan. Um, first of all, project finance, I think that's, uh, it's a little bit ahead of the game in terms of uh, measurement. I think uh, Dr. Tsai mentioned the, uh, their measurement, and I think our uh, measurement in MEFG is uh, very much the same. So I prepared a note, but I'll skip because of the time. <laughs> um, for second, we, uh, we measure our investments. We're starting to measure our investments based on our positive impact of our financing activities. And to this end, our bank adopted a new uh, fund investment strategy, if you will that utilizes the environmental impact of our actual investment as index for making investment decisions, uh, in addition to achieving the economic uh, performance of our investments. So as part of this strategy, uh, the bank introduced an internal carbon pricing system, a method used to compare or measure uh, environmental impact by using expected, expected reduction in CO2 emissions by future carbon prices. Maybe that's something that the uh, play, or the financial players in the region might be able to um, uh, consider. Um, applying this system for the first time in March last year, uh, we made an investment in a renewable uh, energy fund, uh, actually managed by BlackRock. And we expect this fund through uh, the investment by MEFG to help reduce the CO2 emissions throughout the coming years. So it's very interesting concept that um, I hope will grow through the uh, financial system in this ASEAN region. Um, as uh, Ayu Hassan mentioned, there are challenges. And also, um, Rakongos also mentioned the regional differences and the nuances, which is difficult. Um, I believe that the biggest challenge is to, you know, expand the universe of the measurement further from project finance or actual direct lending to power projects that are very visible. So 
so the expanding the uh, universe is one um, key. And the next step is also to uh, setting the clear targets, not just the uh, records or the, uh, the actual um, figures that were in the past, but setting clear targets in measuring the climate impact is very challenging, but I think is important. So um, I think for data operations, it's very uh, a key theme that we need to work. Um, but uh, given the global presence, we like to work with the players in uh, the SAM region. And also maybe support from the government and CIFIA would be uh, appreciated in that aspect. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Muto-san, for your, uh, say, the uh, co com complete, uh, say, e example of the, the challenge and also the, the situation of the MUFG uh, bank. Thank you very much. So, uh, remaining five minutes, let me uh, summarize the uh, uh, this session uh, as my homework. So, uh, first, so that as to roll, we have three. Uh, topics uh, to be discussed here. And the first one is the uh, role of government uh, to promote uh, clean energy finance. Uh, we would say from discussion that the government plays an essential role, as uh, Mr. Prokop and Mr. Dr. Tsai mentioned, uh, in developing enabling environments uh, for clean energy finance. In this point, SEFIA could contribute to creating them as a nexus of uh, bridging public sector, private sector, and then uh, financial institutions by uh, sharing their needs and voices from stakeholders. And as to the uh, state current test of ESG investment and the role of the transition finance, uh, ESG investment has a huge potential uh, in ASEAN region, uh, and then, but the environment is still nascent, and therefore needs. Uh, it seems. Uh, there seems to be needs for support, and then it is uh, that needs would be large. One of the characteristics of ASEAN is a very diverse society. So, from this uh, characteristic, I think that the a concept of, of transition finance, uh, which provides finance to broader industries uh, for their transition, uh, which fits, uh, fits such regions, and then expected to facilitate. Uh, clean energy finance further. And then as to last topic, climate impact measurement, uh, concluding the, the comments from a uh, panelist, uh, the situation is really a uh, nation and then a bank has uh, started to uh, say the fight against this. So, but the, uh, we would say the climate impact measurement uh, is very uh, important issue uh, for the financial institution and then uh also the uh for facilitating clean energy finance further and also the as mr dr tsai mentioned the there are still there are still a lot of uh say field uh, to be discussed and then overcame overcome so there seem to be a large need for solution and the knowledge so inclusion, as this slide shows, if we uh, effectively approach uh, these three topics, uh, we would be able to make a transition uh, for greener uh, society much easier by facilitating finance more. And we hope that SEFIA uh, will play an important role uh, covering three areas. And then the SEFIA uh, would be positioned in the center to connecting the uh, three parts uh, to be a nexus of the uh, clean energy finance, and we hope we can do so. Uh, as a uh, moderator here, I hope that the, today's discussion will be very, very helpful for all participants. And then let me show my sincere appreciation to all presenters and the panelists and for preparing the excellent presentations and sharing valuable comments. Uh, let me conclude uh, to uh, hear the uh, session uh, by showing the my sincere appreciation to all panelists and then uh, all participants. Thank you very much uh, all. And then so back to uh, MC to uh, Alfred. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ayuhasan, for your excellent moderation in session three. Thank you very much to all of the panelists and speakers for your insightful presentations.
Now, we'll, we'll hear the wrap up and closing remarks, which will be delivered by Dr. Nuki Agia Utama, the Executive Director of ASEAN Center for Energy. Dr. Nuki, please, the time and floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alfred. Uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues, on behalf of the ASEAN Center for Energy. I would like to thank the Ministry of Energy of Thailand for hosting the second Safia Forum, as well as the support of the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, Japan, for this perfect arrangements of the forum. Furthermore, I would like to also express my appreciation to all speakers, moderators, participants, as well as panelists of the forum. We had a very insightful and productive forum today, where we have a total of three <coughs> sessions. In the first session, we have seen the notable progress on SEPIA flagship projects from the first SEPIA, which includes rental control, zero buildings, and microgrid. We noted that rental control can reduce around 3% of the energy consumption or approximately 3% of carbon dioxide emission in the target facility through operation optimization. We are also looking forward to the implementation of the zero energy building in ASEAN through policies and, in, and measurements, including efforts to disseminate and promote ZEP in ASEAN or zero energy building in ASEAN, especially among private sectors. We also welcome the initiative Renewable Energy Hybrid Microgrid Technology Demonstration Project in the Philippines. Moreover, in the first session, we also discussed the new potential taxi projects under the SAPIA platform, which are the ASEAN wide collaboration on cleaner finance, a multi dimensional and multi stakeholder collaboration for enabling more funds to finance the sustainable development projects in ASEAN and a new initiative from Denso to promote high efficiency mobile air conditioners or SMAC in ASEAN to reduce carbon dioxide emission in ASEAN transportation sectors through optimizing air conditioner performance and energy management. In session two, we are exploring the possible contribution of SAFIA in the implementation of the ASEAN Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation or APAIC phase two. 2021 to 2025. During the discussion, we noted that SEVIA will bring positive impact in supporting ASEAN in implementation of APAI Phase 2. Our speakers from Thailand and Brunei Darussalam enlightened us on their plans in intensifying AE and EEC program to strive together as ASEAN in accelerating energy transition. Furthermore, we look forward to the development of SAFIA Collaboration Roadmap 2021-2025 in supporting the implementation of API Phase 2, which will consist of three components, such as visualization, finance, and flagship program. In the next third SAFIA Forum, we will finalize and launch the SAFIA Roadmap. We hope that SAFIA could serve as a platform on international cooperation and accelerating energy transition and strengthening energy resilience in the region. In the last session, surely together we had a productive discussion on mobilizing finance for the for decarbonization pathway and gain knowledge from the perspective of financing institutions, both local and international. Moreover, we also witnessed the signing of memorandum of cooperation for IMOC between ASEAN Development Bank and the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry Japan. We look forward to seeing the value of transition finance, which provide <clears throat> finance to broader industries for their transition to a more sustainable society. Moving forward, SEFIA can contribute to creating a nexus among the public sectors, private sectors, and financial institutions within Southeast Asia. Finally, again, we would like to thank Ministry of Energy Thailand and also all the moderators, all speakers, and also, of course, our panelists of the forum for the participation today. Once again, thank you very much. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your kind words, Dr. Nuki Aliyotama. Now I would like to kindly invite Dr. Prasad Sinsu Prasad, Director General, Department of Alternative Energy Development and Efficiency, Ministry of Energy of Thailand, to deliver his closing remarks. Dr. Prasad, please, time is yours. Good afternoon, Dr. Prasad, can you hear my voice? Uh, we would like to share the screen. Could you please pause the chat your power card? Okay. Excellency Nikio Koichi, Elementary Vice Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. After a long day of discussion, we certainly had a very productive meeting today. I really appreciate and thank all of you for your contribution. As our common goal is to use this platform to enhance energy efficiency and facilitate energy transition as well as realization of low carbon society in the region. However, we will face many challenges, but we can be successful through our cooperation. This forum has been forming a valuable function that enables ASEAN country government officials, international organizations, universities and private companies to share the progress of the flagship projects for the future initiatives and also the discussion on mobilizing finance as the path to cleaner energy and low carbon society. We have made significant progress on the previous flagship projects that are in line with the implementation of target phase 2, 2021 to 2025, especially for renewable energy, energy efficiency, and conservation in a market phase 2 program. Ladies and gentlemen, we will need to work together and share ideas and best practices together to achieve our goal. I believe that our region can become a low carbon society, sustainable development through cooperation and both standing and once again, on behalf of the Ministry of Energy of Thailand, I would like to thank the team from the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, METI of Japan, ASEAN Center for Energy, and the Department of Alternative Energy Development and Efficiency, BD, as well as all participants to make this forum happen. And we are looking forward to working together with everyone for cleaner energy in ASEAN. Thank you, and stay safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Prasad. In our last session, I would like to kindly invite all of our panelists, moderators, and speakers to turn on your video camera so we can have a group photo session. All speakers, panelists, and moderators, please turn on your video camera. <laughs>
once again to all the speakers, panelists, and moderators. Please kindly turn on your video camera so we can take our group photo session. Okay, everyone, uh, I will count to three. One, two, three, smile. Okay, once more. One, two, three, smile. Okay, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for all of the panelists, moderators, and speakers, and thank you to all of the participants for attending the second SEFIA forum today. Looking forward to meet you again in our next occasion. Thank you very much, everyone. See you again.